Shabbat Shalom. Another wonderful Shabbat, and it is day 14. Wow, you can count. That's good. <laughs> Hope you can keep counting. Still got a few more sevens to go. Uh, Alex is saying Shabbat Shalom, family. Great to be with you. Carol's saying Shabbat Shalom. And I believe, Alex, that you are uh, taking Henry away for a bit for, for us for a week or so. Yeah? So you guys are going on a nice journey over the waters. <laughs> uh, we hope Henry brings back some good reports and takes the good news with and spreads the, the good news. <laughs> we can all get in your suitcase to Mauritius, we'll do that. But uh, um, we thank our Master that we can gather together in his name and it's just a joy and a privilege. We're getting a taste of winter settling in here uh, for those across the waters. It's starting to warm up for you and we're getting your cold and wet. But uh, we're in our Master's presence, and that's what matters. Come rain or shine, we thank our Master that we, we have breath to praise Him and worship Him. So we're continuing our journey in Bereshit, looking at Bereshit 37 through to 40. And it kind of this week's Torah portion kind of starts with dreams and ends with dreams. And so it highlights wonderful revelations for us that teaches us a valuable lesson to wake up because there's a, there's a journey to be had. There's a... There's a a witness to be given, and there's a road to walk out in unity of our master. So let's look at that as we dwell here, longing for the soon return of our master. We can learn some great lessons on how we ought to dwell and sojourn and praise our master in spirit and truth. So are you reading, Pat? Yeah. Okay, so in Bereshit 37. Hey, Patrick. Okay. Yeah. And Yaakov dwelt in the land of his father's sojourning in the land of Canaan. This is the genealogy of Yaakov. Yosef, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the young man was with the sons of Bila and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph, Joseph brought an evil report of them to his father. <clears throat> And Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a long robe. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and were not able to speak peacefully to him. And Joseph dreamt a dream and told it to his brothers. So they hated him even more, and he said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have dreamed. See, we were binding sheaves in the midst of a field, and see, my sheaf rose up and stood up, and see, your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Shall you indeed rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed still yet another dream and related it to his brothers and said, See, I have dreamed a, another dream and see the sun, the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to me. And he related it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamt? Shall, shall we, your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you and his brothers and his brothers in, envied him but his father guarded the word and his brothers went to feed their flock their father's flock in Shechem and Israel said to Joseph are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem come I send you to them. So he said to him, Yeah, I am. And he said to him, Please go and see if it is well with your brothers and with the sheep, and bring back word to me. So he went, so he sent him out of the valley of Hebron, and he went to Shechem. And a certain man found him and, and see, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, what do you seek? And he said, I'm seeking my brothers. 
please inform me where they are feeding their sheep. And the man said, they have left, they have left here, for I have heard them say, let us go towards Dotem. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Jotem, in Dotem, and they saw him from a distance. And before he came near them, they plotted against him to kill him. And they said to each other, See, this master of dreams is coming. Now, then, come, let us now kill him and throw him into some pit and say, And why? some wild beasts have devoured him. Let us then see what comes of his dreams. But Reuben heard and rescued him from their hands and said, Let us not strike his being. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit which is in the, in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him in order to rescue him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So it came to be when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his robe, the long robe which was on him, and they took him and they threw him into a pit, and the pit was empty and there was no water in it, and they sat down to eat a meal, and they and they lifted their eyes and looked and saw a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilad with their camels, bearing spices, balm, myrrh, going to take them to down, take them down to Mitzrayim. And Yehuda said to his brothers, "What would we gain if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him." To the Ishmaelites, and let let our hand be upon, and let not our hand be upon him, but he is our brother, our flesh. And the brothers listened. Then the Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled Joseph out and lifted him up out of the pit, and and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver, and they took Joseph to Mitzrayim. Then Reuben returned to the pit, and see, Joseph was not in the pit, and he tore his garments. And he returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and where am I to go? So they took Joseph's robe, slew a male goat, and dipped the robe in blood, and sent the long robe and brought it to their father and said, we have found this. Please look at it, if, if it is the robe of your son or not. And he recognized it and said, It is my son's robe, and an evil beast has devoured him. Joseph is torn, torn to pieces. And Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his waist and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, Now let me go down to Sheol to my son in mourning. So his father wept for him. And, and the Midianites said, and the Midianites said to him, the Midianites that, that had, sold, had sold him, to Mitzrayim, to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Okay, so this week's Torah portion is called Vayeshev, which means and he dwelt. And we see here how Yaakov had now settled in the land, the promise that was land that was given to as a promise to Abraham and his descendants. And Yitzchak confirmed with Yitzchak, given now to Yaakov to sojourn in. And we see this clear structure here of dwelling in the presence of our master versus Esau, who is likened to one who's left the land when he went south. 
south to Edom. So again, we see a clear, already at the beginning of this Torah portion, we see a clear difference between those who walk according to the spirit and those who walk according to the flesh. You know, and so the Hebrew word that's translated as dwelt, we've looked at that a number of times as we go through the Torah, yashav, which means to sit, dwell, inhabit, and it carries in the Hebraic mindset an understanding of sitting and learning. You know, not just waiting for better days, not just sitting around waiting for things to happen when you're not out actually doing what you should be doing. So um, it's sitting and learning, gaining, coming to the master's feet, the good teacher, letting him teach us how to sojourn. And Psalm 119 verse 54 says, your laws have been my songs in the place of my sojournings, you know. And so we see a wonderful picture here because Kepha reminds us to remind ourselves and appeals to us as sojourners and pilgrims to abstain from the fleshly lusts <coughs> which battle against the being, having our behavior among the nations good so that when they see our good works, when they speak against you as evildoers, let them by observing our good works esteem Elohim in the day of his visitation. That's in 2 Peter, or 1 Peter 2 verse 11 to 12. What we see here is a powerful witness of we know that we have got to dwell here, but we don't make our dwelling so permanent that we're not able to move as the master's cloud moves. You know, we don't get so bogged down by the things of the world. And at the moment, it's easy to get so bogged down by the fleshly things of the world that's going on that you feel hopeless and no, you feel in despair. And what are you supposed to do? Where we are supposed to be sojourning with his laws being our songs. And Shaul tells us that we should speak to each other in songs and psalms of praise and spiritual songs. And we should be building each other up if we're walking around around held down by the weight of the world and its pressures how we are to, how are we supposed to encourage each other because when we walk according to the spirit and dwelling in the master we actually have a freedom that we can run in a freedom that we can rejoice in and live in as sojourners here because we know he's coming soon so we're not looking at this the natural right now and we, we, we're determining how we live based on what we see we determine how we live based on who we know and therefore know that in him we have the overcoming you know and so we are to uh, you can look at the notes i didn't uh print out any pictographs but i like the word for for a sojourner it comes from the root word uh, um sojournings is the word magur but it comes from the root word uh, uh, gur which means to sojourn abide or dwell or reside and it's spelt with a gimel a vav and a riesh. now if you in your mind hopefully by now you kind of got some pictures in your mind when you hear a gimel it's in the pictographic it's a picture of a foot it represents walk or walking or Gathering, so when we, you need to use your feet to, to get to a place. So you gather, you walk, you walk together, you gather. And the, the Vav is a picture of a tent peg. A few months to go, Sukkot, we need tent pegs so we don't fly away. And then the, it represents to add, secure, or hook. Without tent pegs, we have no securing of the dwelling. Mm. Now we even say that our master says in the prophets that if he did not leave us a tent in the dwelling, a tent peg in the dwelling place, that again highlights our, how, who our master is for us as the peg that gives us the ability to be built up on and secured in him. He is the yated, that's the Hebrew word for peg, in the set apart place that's been left for us so that we have a secure building to, to be built up in. The reish is ahead of a man represents the chief, the top, the captain. So to sojourn here, or gur, means that you're one whose feet are secure in the head. And what that means is our walk is secure in who our head is. We're not scurrying around looking to the left or to the right. We're sojourning here with confidence because we have shalom. We just sang just now, Yahweh shalom, he's our peace. Mm -hmm. And therefore we can walk in him as we are abiding in him and sojourning as we should, sitting at his feet, learning his ways, so that when we need to go out and walk, we walk in the shoes of peace, so to speak. The readiness of the good news of peace we have already in us, armed in his Torah, not being shaken by the world that's around us right now. And Yashav ha highlights the idea of being obedient to the word of the house. So it's just highlights for me, when we start this Torah portion, it's a reminder that our home is still coming. Our dwelling is in the heavens. But we are sojourning and dwelling here as ambassadors of that permanent dwelling that's coming. We are going to inherit the earth, but the rule and reign that's coming, we get to live out here as we sojourn here as strangers in the world. You know? 
But don't let that bog you down. Don't let that make you feel weighted down with whatever. We need to let the world see our good works, see how we work. And they will call us evildoers and they'll speak things against you. They don't like what you do because it, it kind of puts a mirror against them. But let them, by observing your good works now, esteem Elohim in the day of his visitation. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Yahweh is Yeshua, our master. And so they might not confess it right now, but when, when he comes, they will. And it will be a, a witness to them of all the good works and observance to obedience to the commands of our master and the keeping in timing with his walk as we walk secure in our head, keeping in step in unity of the belief that it will be witnessed when he comes by all those who spoke against us. You know, they're going to speak against you now, but that's okay. You know, don't let that stop your good works as you sojourn here with great joy in the master and let his laws be the songs that keep you going. His laws shouldn't be something, oh, I have to do this, I have to do that. The law should be something that lifts you up because a song lifts you up. So when the psalmist is writing, your laws have been my songs, he can literally be singing some of the laws, but it's something that says it brings a freedom to me. I have an identity. I can walk with confidence because your laws teach me how to walk. It's not like I have to find my own way and I don't know which way to go. I'm secure in the master. My feet are secure in the head. This is a, a clear witness of Yaakov settling in the land that Yahweh promised, you know. And so it starts then off after making that clear that this is the genealogy of Yaakov which is the Hebrew word toldos, which means also history. So it's not only a genealogical registration but it also or births, but it also carries the idea of a course of history. So whenever you see generations or genealogies in Scripture, there's more to it than just a list of birthing order. There's a story there for it, you know. Mm -hmm. Even in the genealogy of Messiah from in Matit Yahu 1, from Avraham to Messiah, there's a wonderful message in the genealogy from Abraham, the exalted father, to Messiah, who's our savior. You know, and so we see, so too here, when, when Moshe is giving us this account, it starts off, this is the genealogy of Yaakov, and then it starts off that uh, ya Yosef being 17 years of age. Mm -hmm. So it shows you this is the course of history of Yaakov's sojournings in the land of promise. You know, and so we in our master now have a history that's begun so to speak, as we are sojourning here in our master's promises, which are yes and amen in him, as long as we are clinging to him. And so from this account, we see a, a wonderful picture that Yosef, being 17 years of age, he was feeding the flock uh, with his brothers, Dan and Naphtali. These were sons of Bilhah, Rivka's uh, maid, or Rachel's maidservant. And Gad and Asher were sons of Zilpah, so, uh, Leah's maidservant. So they were all together in the field. And something must have been going on in the field. You know, uh, Moshe is giving us some witness here of the history behind. So we get the crux of the matter to learn some great insight. But we obviously know that there's something had been going on while Yosef's with his brothers in the field because he brings an evil report about his brothers to his father. So, I mean, it's not like he just feels like saying something horrible to his dad about his brother. Something was going on in the field. And it teaches us a valuable lesson because here Yosef is still a youth. He's still got a lot to learn. By the time he's 30 and he becomes ruler in Mitzrayim, he's learned a lot and he knows how to govern. But now he's still learning. He's in, and so some of the things we can learn from that we've got to put away childish things. We've got to grow up and get mature in the word. And part of that is refinement that happens through some of the choices that we make and realize they were the wrong choices. We could have done it better. And that's how we learn. So the Hebrew word that's uh, it's, um, translated as report, when he report back to his father, is deba, which means a whispering, a defamation, a defamation, an evil report, or a slander. That's what this word means. In other words, he brought a slanderous whispering to his father. In other words, he came and he tattletailed, you know. And so he brings this slanderous report, and we can see that this set in motion a whole s series of events in the life of Yosef from his brothers who would, in the future, send him into exile, you know, and in type regard him as lost and dead. You know, so through the power of his own tongue, 
Yosef kick-started a few events that would bring about a journey that certainly could have been avoided, but Yahweh works it all out for good. But that's not the excuse. We learn a valuable lesson here. We're told in Scripture that we are not to slander. We're not to gossip. We're not to have whisperings. We should be able to speak freely because the gossip and slander, it brings division. Ephesians 4 verse 31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and displeasure and uproar and slander be put away from you along with all evil. I mean, it's like he, 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 we were speaking this week. I mean, this all evil. I mean, he could probably write written another three books about all the kinds of evil, but he says these are the things that stand out which people don't see as evil. Because when you say evil to things, generally people understand evil in its broader perspective, and you can name a whole lot of things. But they won't often see slander and bitterness and wrath and things as being equated as similar to all the evil that must be put off. You know, and so what we see from this historical account of Yosef in, is how his youthfulness is being clearly highlighted here. He's very immature in how to deal with the situation. Mm. And we have to learn in our own lives, doesn't matter our physical age, we have to learn in our own lives that we have to guard our tongue at all times. Yaakov reminds us that this little member, you know, it can start fires, you know, and it's like a little rudder of the ship. It turns a huge big ship where it wants to go. And so a tongue also directs a flow of where things are, 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 des or, are, are kind of like focused toward going, you know. Um, we see 1 Peter 3 verse 10 to 11. It says, he who wishes to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Now we see a powerful thing here is that right through the nude writings as well is we can see the deceit of lawlessness is one of the obvious things that we've all come out from mm -hmm. and how many are allowing that to be the words on their lips. The Torah has done away with that. That's actually tongues of deceit as well and it's, the, and it's the delusion and deceit of lawlessness that is gripping so many people and actually ex causing them to be exiled, if you will, from Yahweh's presence, you know. And so there's valuable lessons right through Scripture and teaching us on guarding our lips against deceit. You know, um, Tehillah 119, I love 119, verse 118 says, You have made light of all those who stray from your laws, for falsehood is their deceit. And when, when it says you have made light of those, what it's also saying is that making light is the opposite to making heavy. Does it make sense? And the word esteem means to give weight or to give heaviness to, to give substance, to take serious. So when Yahweh says he makes light of those who stray from his laws, he's basically saying he doesn't take them, he's not listening to those people, to their requests. We just sang a song, when I call on you, you answer me, looking at the words of Tehillah 91. Because the righteous know that he hears, he hears our pleas. But when we're not walking in his laws, and his laws aren't the song of our heart in our sojournings, then why would we think Yahweh would be taking weight of the words that we're bringing to him? And when he makes light of it, he's saying, well, let your own deceit save you, you know? For falsehood is their deceit. And so we see a powerful thing here that right through Israel's journey, we're looking at Yosef's history, but we jump forward a few times and we see the shadow pictures and patterns that it's like we never learn the lessons. I'm saying we in a collective of people that are supposed to be called out and serving Yahweh. Mm. Echa or Lamentations, which Yirmiyahu wrote, I mean, as the weeping prophet, he's lamenting over the state of Israel and Yehuda in their depravity. In fact, Israel had already been exiled and divorced. Now Yehuda is more treacherous, acting more s deceitful and strange. And in Lamentations 2 verse 14, it says, Your prophets have seen falsehood and folly for you and have not shown you your crookedness to turn back your captivity. But, but their divisions for you are false and misleading tongues. Again, this is the danger of whisperings and musings and little things that carry on in the background, like we see when we get to numbers of Kurach and the rebellion and all these things. These are things that the tongue starts. And so we're learning a valuable insight here of coming back to Bereshit 37 and how taking this slanderous whispering to the Father kick-started a whole series of events. And Yosef was loved by Israel more than all the other brothers, for he was born to Yosef in old age. And his, his father, yeah, 
Sorry, Yosef was loved by Israel. Yeah, what did I say? Uh, he was, sorry, born to Yosef. Uh, sorry, uh, um, he was born to, I said he was born to Yosef. Yosef wasn't born to Yosef, thank you. <laughs> Yosef was born to Yaakov, Yisrael, in his old age. Okay. In your notes, it says Yosef. I know, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you're all awake still, it's a test. <laughs> you know, and one of the things that we see here is there's a clear choice and it, and it had spiritual ramifications, which we see prophetically down the line, that he made this special long, long, long robe, not wrong robe, long robe <laughs> for, for Yosef. And can anybody remember, you're not reading the notes, uh, Henry. You can put your notes aside. What's the word for long robe, not Henry? Can you remember? You know, after we go through this year after year, you say, oh, I've done that Torah portion already. Well, then what's the name of the robe? Or, you know, the Hebrew word is kethoneth, and I don't have a lith. Okay. <laughs> kethoneth means a tunic, a garment, or a clothing, or a covering that's more complete than just a normal loincloth. Okay. It's a basic garment that definitely reaches at least to the knees, maybe longer. Now, what makes this special is that this word kethoneth is used to describe the embroidered long shirt that the high priest in, uh, would wear as described in Vaikra 8, you know, as part of the tunic, because there, was there, were, there were various garments that the high priest would put on. And it's a prophetic shadow picture that we see here by Yosef being chosen by his father to be in a position or status of being firstborn or being the head by giving him this special garment, you know, shadow picture of Messiah who's firstborn of all creation and high priest. You know, who, who is clothed from on high. And so this word kethoneth is also used in Bereshit 3 verse 21, where Yahweh put coats of skins on Adam and Chava when he sent them out in the garden, when he dressed them. And the Hebrew word for coats is kethoneth. So he gave them a covering. So what this word represents is not just a, a long robe, it represents a special robe, a covering, a highlighted chosen robe. It has a unique purpose, you know. Now, the word kethoneth is used 29 times in the Tanakh. And it's used specifically in reference to the priestly garments. Um, it's also used to describe the, the coat that David's daughter wore. Remember, his daughter was defiled by his son, you know. Tamar was defiled, his daughter. And so, but she wore that kethoneth, and that's the kethoneth that she tore when she was grieved, you know, by being treated or mistreated. And so we also see another account where this word kethoneth is used in Yeshayahu. I'd like to read this passage from 15 to 21. He said, Thus said the master Yahweh of hosts, Go, come to the steward, to Shevna, who is over the house, and say, What have you here, and whom have you here, that you have hewn a tomb here? And he who hews himself a tomb on high, cutting out a resting place for himself in a rock, See, Yahweh is hurling you away, O man, and is firmly grasping you, rolling you up tightly like a ball into a wide land. There you are to die, and there your esteemed chariots are to be the shame of your master's house. And I shall drive you from your office, and you shall be ousted from your position. And it shall be in that day that I shall call my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiyahu, and I shall put your robe on him and strengthen him with your girdle and give your authority into his hand. And he shall be a father to, in the, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Yehuda. Now, this is a rebuke given to Shevna, which means vigor. He was the secretary to Hizkiyahu, but what he was doing is he... He was so close to royalty, to his Kiyahu, being a servant, being, a, you know, he was the, the secretary. He was so close to his Kiyahu that he assumed that he's also one of the royals, so to speak, and took that authority into, he, had, he felt he had the right to be treated like a king himself. And it's uh, Yeshiyahu 22, verse 15 to 21. And so this is a, a wonderful picture for us. I'm going through these parts in Scripture which represent this word kethoneth and how Yahweh says, I'm going to take that kethoneth and I'm going to put it on Eliakim and he's going to rule. Now this is a powerful shadow picture of Satan, the counterfeit Messiah, the anti-Messiah, who has tried to take the position of king. And in Chazon 19 verse 20, it tells us that the beast and the false prophet will be thrown into the lake of fire. So was Shevna to be thrown out. 
And Eliakim would be the one who would now receive the robe, the kesoneth, of authority that would be put on him. So this robe represents authority, you know. And it pictures Messiah taking his rightful place as high priest and king. Now Yosef would later be established in a position of authority as governor over Mitzrayim, you know, and bring about the deliverance of his family. We look at Yeshiyahu, the name Eliakim means El sets up or El raises up. And Hilkiyahu means my portion is Yah. So already we see that Hilkiyahu was the high priest during the reign of Yoshiyahu. Yoshiyahu was the one that reigned when he was eight years old, remember? And in the 18th year of his reign, they found the Torah and he made reforms, etc. And, he, and he, he got people to return to covenant. And he destroyed all the false worship mm -hmm. in the land. And they, had, they never had a Pesach like they had in his day ever before because it was, this was a clear renewal and understanding what Yahweh has done to call people out of darkness. So why I'm mentioning all of these is because we see already here the identity that was being given to Yosef as a prophetic shadow picture of Yeshua, our master, who too would be rejected and hated by his brothers. So one of the things that we are typically taught growing up is that, uh, you know, they do plays about it. You know, uh, you know his, his, co go oh, his coat of many colors. Mm. You know, nowhere in scripture does it tell us that there was many colors on this coat. Uh, in fact, the Hebrew word for, that describes this robe as long, it's a long robe. And the, the Hebrew word that's used for long is pas, which means uh, flat of the hand or foot, long sleeve, tunic reaching to the palms and soles. So it wasn't just one that just went to the knees. I'm saying it was a, a full covering. And what made this unique is that when you wore this robe, this wasn't something that you could go and work in the field with. So it was clearly an identity that this one's special, you know. And so we take note that it don't go along with the nursery things that you were taught in error, that you just get this little boy with this very colorful coat on or whatever. It was simply a long robe, you know. And it may have had colors. We're not saying it didn't have colors, but the, I hear what I'm saying. I think a lot of times the focus is on these many colors, and they make that the focal point, not highlighting that this robe actually represents authority, represents higher position than the others, represents a new uh, role for this one, that your role isn't to be outdoing that. Your role is special, unique. And so we find a powerful picture again that it would have been difficult to perform daily shepherding duties in this long robe. And so therefore it shows that the labor that was required by Yosef's brothers would not be required of him. And the picture of being royal garments, it speaks of them that, they, that you know, and, and they, that they are the ones serving and, and uh, uh, being served and not serving. You know, and so when we understand this, we also and how we see a picture of our master because he is our royal high priest and king. But what he does is he took off his royal robe to come and serve us. So Yosef wasn't the one to be serving in that robe because in that robe, long robe, you're not doing service to your brothers. It is a high priestly role that does service in the tabernacle as part of the high priest garments. But in terms of the field working, it's not a service that the rest of the brothers would do. And so when Messiah comes and we're told in Philippians 2 verse 5 or uh, 5 to 8 it says let this mind be in you which was also in Messiah Yeshua who being in the form of Elohim did not regard equality with Elohim a matter to be grasped but emptied himself taking the form of a servant and came to be in the likeness of men having been found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death death even of a stake this is what he's saying is, Shaul's highlighting to us that Yeshua didn't come and say, all right, here I am, this is me, I'm prophet, this is uh, here. He came in our form, humbled himself, took off his position of creator and redeemer of all in the esteem of his position, because Yochanan says we saw the esteem of Elohim as of a son brought forth of a father. So he came in, in a form not to set up a reign, he came to serve. And to do that, he took in type his ketoneth off, his royal robe off. And he humbled himself, and he came to serve us. And this is a lesson how we as a royal priesthood must not assume to be so high and lofty and high-minded, like the religious Pharisee that came and said, oh, I fast and pray so many times a week. You know, 
almost be like that one that came in beating his chest and saying, I'm not worthy. But he went out forgiven much and able to do much service in the body. And so Yosef had received this position and calling from his father in his youth. And yet later, he would certainly be the one who would end up serving his brothers and saving them. You know, the greatest among you shall be your servant. So while his brothers were getting angry with him, because look at you, you know, and getting angry because this one goes and tattletales all the time. This goody two shoes is just always telling the, you know, dad everything we're doing, you know, and so his brothers hated him. You gotta, you, if someone says I love Elohim and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one not loving his brother whom he has seen, how is he able to love Elohim who he has not seen? And so we see here something, the stuff that had gone on between them had caused his brothers to hate. Now, what would cause a brother to hate somebody that's actually been set apart as royalty? Because they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. You see, people will only hate you, and Yeshua says you'll be hated and persecuted because of righteousness sake. So there's this kind of dual lesson that we get here, because in one sense we say, okay, was Yaakov being a tattletale, or was he just declaring the truth and being... A, a bringing report of this is what they're doing because in this chapter we also see in this Torah portion when Yaakov says to Yosef go and see if my what how my how your brothers are doing in other words go see if they're doing what I'm I told them to do and so and bring back tell me what they're doing so this had been something that ya, that Yaakov had got Yosef to do go what are your brothers doing he'd come back and tell them they got upset because why because they weren't about the father's business it's clear and so they detested, you know, uh, and it says in this, the children of Elohim and the children of the devil are manifest. Everyone not doing righteousness is not of Elohim, neither the one not loving his brother. So here we see uh, why his brothers needed to be redeemed by him later on in type of a picture. Because they were not acting as covenant children and covenants of the promise that they should have been. You know, and we see right through this Torah portion how they certainly, through their hatred, we're not being true in loving their brother as they should. Because love covers a multitude of transgressions, you know. And so Yosef is a clear shadow picture. I say it's probably one of the biggest shadow pictures right through Scripture in the life of Yosef of Messiah and his journey here on earth. Mishle 26 verse 24 to 26 says, He who hates pretends with his lips and lays up deceit within him. Though he speaks kindly, do not believe him, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Hatred is covered by deceit. His evil is disclosed in the assembly. Because you can't cover up deceit in the assembly in Yahweh's presence, because it will come to light. It will be brought to light, you know. And the Torah is supposed to be in our hearts and our mouths in order to do it. We're supposed to be speaking to each other with the word, the truth. We shouldn't be slandering each other. We shouldn't be whispering about each other. We should be up, building up one another, uplifting each other in the truth, you know, and cautioning each other. We, we, you know, we, we need to reprove each other when it's necessary. We need to build each other up when it's necessary. But doing it in a wicked way. That's deceit. That's slander. That's the kind of false dibba that, that, you know, Yosef did it in the wrong way, as from a type and account that we see here. And so then he has dreams, you know, from verse 5 to 11. As I said, this Torah portion kind of starts with dreams. Then we're going to end this week's readings with the dreams of the baker and the cupbearer, you know. And so being hated by his brothers, he's given some prophetic dreams which he relates to his brother and his father. I mean, because here's Yosef, that's one that relates everything, you know, which is not a bad thing, you know. And so he's so enthusiastic about rendering these dreams because these weren't just like a dream that you wake up, as Psalm says, you, you throw it away, you discard it. This was a clear message that he knew this is a dream that I need to relate, you know. And so it's one thing that he received a special robe from his father, yet now he was seemingly mocking his brothers with his dreams. Because they weren't stupid. You know, they could understand that what you're implying here, you know. These dreams were very prophetic and it had a very clear message that was to be heeded by his family because days of famine were lying ahead. But they weren't interested in hearing what this fancy coat man had to say to them, you know. 
And Amos 3 verse 7, we know Yahweh does no matter unless he reveals his secret through his servants, the prophets. So Yahweh was certainly revealing what was to come through Yosef, highlighting that Yosef is a prophet of Yahweh. And so the hatred of his brothers just kept on growing more and more and more. And, you know, in revealing these dreams, one may tend to think that it would have been better for Yosef to just keep his mouth shut. But when we need to speak the master's truth, it teaches us a valuable lesson that when we need to speak up, we should not hold back. And we need to relate the word, the word that reveals and declares the truth, no matter the outcomes or how it may or may not be received. We have to be bold and courageous, you know. Yechezkiel was told, speak, even if they listen to you or don't listen to you, because if you don't speak, I'll hold it on you. But if you speak and they don't receive it, then it's off you. You know, Yeshiyahu was told, go and speak. Tell them where, to a people that aren't going to listen to you. How long? Till destruction comes. Don't stop speaking. And so we need to learn the valuable lesson that when we know that we know that we know there are things that need to be spoken, we need to speak it out because bottling it up is going to do nobody any good. You know, and these dreams are very clear that Yosef would be set up to rule over his family during the time of famine, and he would be set up as sovereign in their midst, and they just didn't want to hear any of these weird dreams that he was giving, you know. What we see here is these two dreams shadow picture for us the two comings of Messiah. In the first dream, we're able to recognize the first time Yeshua would come in the flesh and serve. As we said, he took off his robe, so to speak. He came to serve, and by the words of this dream, how Messiah would come into the world in order to call men unto himself. In Yosef's dream, he says to his brothers, we were binding sheaves in the field. It wasn't you were binding, we. In other words, he was working with his brothers in this dream. And he saw how he was with his brothers in the field, gathering and binding up the sheaves. So in the parables of Messiah, our master tells us that the field is the world. And so the term binding sheaves is malmim alumim, and it means basically the word for binding, alam, means to bind or to bring together. It's written in the causative uh, tense, so it means it's that in the, not in causative, in the intensive uh, tense. It means it's, it's, it's not just going and picking up. It's really come with a purpose. It's the harvest, you know. And the harvest isn't done just, oh, well, we'll walk along. And we say, oh, that's a nice one. Pick that up. It's done with a focus and a purpose to gather in. You know, and sheaves, aluma, means a bundle or things that are tied together. So we see a clear witness in the harvest of end times. We see, firstly, there's a gathering of the donnell that's put into bundles and kept for the fire, and then the, the, the wheat is gathered. So the gathering is of two, two groups of people, the wicked and then the righteous. And so when Messiah first came, he emptied himself, he took on the form of a servant, he came to be in the likeness of men, and here in this dream we're able to see how Yosef being with his brothers in the field, it would mean that he would have to take off his long robe in order to serve. So I hope you see the pictures here. He came to seek, our master came to seek out the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, he came, came to seek and save what was lost and bind up the set-apart ones, gather them into groups so that when he comes again, that he can gather his bride that's been separated from the Donnell. And in his first dream, Yosef's, after this first dream, Yosef's brothers, they even hated him even more. They refused to accept that they'll, he'll be ruler over him. And we see this over them, and we see this pattern in Scripture. Remember, Moshe, who made you ruler over us? Well, Yahweh did, you know, with Lot. They put him in position after Abraham and his servants rescued them from the five kings. Then after they didn't like the rulings and everything else of what Lot was doing as righteousness, look at this one, who made him judge here? So we see when you are doing righteousness, people aren't going to like what you're saying. Who made you? Who told you this? Who, what right do you have to speak these things to us? We're told in Luke 19 verse 14, it says, but his subjects were hating him and sent a delegation after him to say, we do not wish this one to reign over us. In Yochanan 1 verse 10 to 11, it says, he was in the world and the world came to be through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. 
So in the second dream, Yosef now relates a bigger picture at play. And he relates that to his father and his brothers that how the moon and the 11 stars bow down to him, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars. This was a clear metaphor for the whole family bowing down. And they were even saying, but how is the, you know, should, should your mother also bow down to you? So Yaakov had understanding of what is to come and a resurrection to come, but he can't understand your mother's dead. How is she supposed to now? You're saying that you're all going to bow down to us. And while they hated him even more, Yaakov kept this word. When you see that he kept this word, like Miriam when she was told that she would have child, you know, and this would be the son of the living Elohim, she kept that word in her heart. In other words, she retained it. She wasn't able to explain it. Yaakov couldn't now try and understand and fully explain it to his sons that rejected it, so he retained it. He didn't let it go and just throw it away. He didn't discard it, you know. And so he then sees this, through these dreams, we see a shadow picture of Messiah when he will return to gather the sheaves that have been bound up. And this speaks of the first resurrection when the dead of Messiah will be raised first and all who are alive will be caught up with him mm -hmm. together in the air to meet with him and be taken to Yerushalayim. You know, blessed are the set apart, blessed and set apart is the one having part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them or authority over these, but they shall be priests of Elohim and of Messiah and shall reign with him a thousand years. Right now, we've been given garments of righteousness to work the field, to go about as our master's ambassadors, binding, gathering the sheaves, going and taking the message out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we'll know them by those who hear and we gather them and we're getting them and we're binding them. When he comes and we are changed in the twinkling of an eye, we then receive our permanent robes of righteousness that will rule and reign with him in the authority of his kingdom. And so Yosef's, Yosef's mother being dead in this prophetic dream, it was highlighting a resurrection, the blessed first resurrection. So many people today are refusing to listen to and clearly understand the prophetic words of Scripture that distinctly reveal to us who Messiah is. That there's one husband, one bride, one people that are betrothed to the Master. Now, every created being can become part of that bride. That's the good news, you know. But it's our Master who took the form of creation in order to redeem a created people back to himself to have his image and likeness completely restored to be one. Just as Adam and Chava originally were separated but clung together to be one, so too are we who are birthed out of Messiah's blood and by his spirit we're grafted into him to be made one with him and therefore we have to stay in him so that he stays in us, that we have this uh, uh, clear I'm not going to say uh, expectation. That's the word. I lost it for a moment there. The expectation that n doesn't get lost, <laughs> you know. And so in the parable of the ten miners, uh, minas, maybe I'll say that because in miners you're thinking of a guy digging under the ground. No, a mina, <laughs> okay. Messiah teaches, of, teaches us of a certain nobleman who went to, to a distant country to receive for himself a reign and a rule. And he gave ten servants... Ten minas to trade until he came, and they refused. And we're told in Luke 19, verse 14, it says, But his subjects were hating him and sent a delegation after him to say, What we do not wish this one to reign over us. Again, he's giving these parables. Yeshua has come very clearly, as pictured through the life of Yosef. I'm here to rescue you. Who are you? You long robed one, you dreamer. Look at this dreamer of dreams. And so his brothers envied him because the father retained the word. In other words, the father didn't rebuke Yosef for his dreams, which the brothers were hoping he would do. And so because of that, the envy and jealous hatred grew even more. And so now they go out. Envy is a terrible thing. We're, we're told in Scripture that a healthy heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. Now, it's in the bones that blood is made. Life is in the blood. So we see that envy or jealousy will kill you because it will dampen out and darken and, and cripple any life that's in a person. And that's Mishle 14, verse 30. 
So in scripture, we see the same root word that's used for zealous as well as envy or jealous. Our master is a jealous Elohim. He's not dying. There's a zeal, there's a fire, and it can be used in a positive sense like the zeal of Pinchas, putting to death the whoring in the camp, standing up for what's right, not just watching it go on and not saying something. But the wrong kind of envy is when you're not getting what you want. Somebody else is getting it. Look at Yosef. He got the long robe. Oh, his father's keeping his dreams intact. He's not rebuking him. Oh, look at this one. Why doesn't our dad treat us this way? A lesson for parents today to make sure that, you know, you bring your children up with the same love. The same. When we're looking in the Torah, we see lessons in Scripture, how even Yahweh says, Esau I have hated, Yaakov I love, because it's a clear distinction between flesh and spirit. But when we're bringing our children up in covenant, we can't be loving one more than the other. We've got, to, we've got to nurture their different talents, their different giftings, and make sure that there's no envy and jealousy between them, training them about this, you know, to love one another, and that they are uniquely different. They don't have to be doing the same things because Yahweh's created us all differently, you know. And so we also see a, a, a lot of lessons in Scripture about the dangers of the wrong kind of zeal. or when I'd rather say zeal in the positive sense and envy in the negative sense from an English perspective because it makes better picture in our minds, you know. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but be in the fear of Yahweh all day long. How many times do you find people that are on this walk and they're actually jealous of what lawless people are doing? Oh, why can't I do that? If you're getting that in your heart, the fear of Yahweh is not in you. And he's here it's saying the, the way to guard you against being envious of what the world's doing is to be in the fear of Yahweh all day long. You know? Yaakov tells us where jealousy and self-seeking are, there is confusion and every foul deed because there's no focus. Where there's jealousy and self-seeking, when you're only looking out for what I can get because I deserve it, it's not fair that they got it, it's confusion. It's, and where confusion is, it says every foul deed. There's nothing clean about it. There's nothing set apart. Shaul reminds us that one of the things that must also be not even practiced amongst us is envy. Envy is equated with murders, drunkenness, wild parties, and the like of which I forewarn you, even as I said before, that those who practice such as these shall not inherit the reign of Elohim. This is a warning that the brothers highlight as a lesson to us. When you are envious of others, you are risking your entrance into the reign of Elohim. His brothers went to Shechem and they didn't obey. Shechem means shoulder or back, and it's a valuable lesson. We know Shechem is the place where our master met the Shomironi woman at the well. Shechem was the capital of the house of, of Israel in Ephraim's territory. And so we see a powerful picture here of this instruction that Yosef's given. Go and see if your brothers, what they're doing in the field. So we see... In Lucas 18, verse 8, our master says, I say to you that he shall do right to them speedily, but when the son of Adam comes, shall he find belief on the earth? So when our master came in the first time without his royal robe, came to start binding the sheaves, not yet to be worshipped because the sun and the moon and the stars, that's at the, the end harvest, but he came to gather the sheaves together, they rejected him. And, he, and basically, he came in an inspection route. He came with the good news, an inspection route, so to speak. You know? And we're told here a number of times our master says, when he comes again, will he find belief? Will he find obedience? And so Yosef going out to the field, which is pictured as prophetically as the word, we see how the son came in the role of a son to come and see what's going on. Bring the good news to say, this is it. Here's entrance to the rain. Then go back, take up his rightful position in the heavens to now say, when I come again, will I find belief? Because I brought the revelation of what belief is. So there is now no excuse. Acts says there is now no excuse for any ignorance. You know, you can't claim I did not know because the revelation of Yeshua Messiah has been made known to all. 
you know. When Yosef got to Shechem, his brothers weren't there. In other words, they weren't where they should have been. And so they weren't about their father's business. And that's what ya Yaakov asked Yosef to go and see. Go see what they're doing and come and tell me. So he's wandering about in the field, and then he, he, he meets a guy in the field, and the guy says, what are you doing? He obviously looked at Yosef, wondering what's going on, looking this way, that way. No, I'm looking for my brothers. No, they're not here. The guy knew his brothers. Mm. No, they've gone down to Dothan. Now, Dothan means two wells. Now, it was a few kilometers north of Shechem, so it wasn't just uh, a couple of hundred yards. They'd taken their sheep and everything, and they'd gone a, a long distance away from where they should have been. They were supposed to be at the place of shouldering the burdens, so to speak, because Shechem teaches us a valuable lesson of carrying each other's burdens so as to fill the, the, the Torah of Messiah. They were at a place of two wells, and so they weren't about their father's business, they were about their own business. And there's valuable lessons that we can take here because it's possible that this place of two wells, it may have been one of those two wells that had dried up that they threw Yosef into, in type, in a pit. And from these wells versus where they should have been, we see a powerful picture because at Shechem, where the, the well of Yaakov was dug, that where Yeshua met with the Shomironi woman and, and said, if you knew who was asking a cup of water from you, then you know that he'd be the one that would give you water's of life, living waters that would come out from you. Give me this water, she said. So Shechem and the, and the interaction with the Shomironi woman at the well is a picture of him coming to bind the sheaves of Israel, to call and to see what's going on and to give them access to the living waters. Come and buy without price, you who thirst, you know. So Shechem in type represents the pure living waters, the source of life. Because our master took upon his shoulders our sin, our crookedness, our transgressions, and he bore our, our sin upon himself that we may have life in him and life abundantly. As long as we drink of him, we will never thirst again because we know our source. Now, having left that source to go to a place of two wells, possibly dried up, which means it's muddy pits, is a picture of muddied waters, the wrong sources. And so the two wells that the brothers were at can represent for us false sources. And coming out of false sources today, where Israel was rebuked in the book of Yechezkiel of the priests having muddied the waters for self-gain. And that's what Dothan represents for us, is that when you're about self-seeking and not about the Father's business, because when our Master taught us to pray, our Father who is set apart, our Father in the heavens set apart be your name, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in the heavens. In other words, I will be doing what you command me to do. Because the pattern that was given on earth is a reflection of what's in the heavens. Therefore, let me keep that pattern. Not my will, but your will be done. The brothers represent those saying, we know the Father's will, but we'll do what we want. And isn't that a picture of muddied waters today? Yes, the word says this, but, and I'll put in my own catechism, we say this. The dogmas of man, you know, forsaking the commands of Elohim while holding fast to the teachings of man, the commands of men that are taught. So Dothan was a very important trade route city in a sense. It was a very pagan influence city because it kind of just accepted everything and anything around the world. It was a main highway that stretched from uh, um, Mitz all the way to, to Mitzrayim. So you go from Shechem or north of Shechem, so you, you already, Shechem is in the south, is in the north already, sorry, of Yerushalayim. So now you go north, it's, it's even further north. So all the way past Yerushalayim, all the way to Mitzrayim, it's one of the main trade routes. Mm. And so the Hebraic understanding of these scriptures is that the brothers were indulging themselves and not caring about their father's sheep. And it also meant that the brothers were not walking in the Torah and the instructions of their father. They were doing whatever they wanted. Yosef's brothers were not feeding the flocks in Shechem they, as they were supposed to be. They were feeding themselves, so to speak. Yechezkiel 34, verse 1 to 3, it says, The word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus said the master Yahweh to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. 
Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and you put on the wool. You slaughter the fatlings. You do not feed the flock. In other words, you're doing it all for self and you, you're leaving the people naked, starved, hungry. Why do you think Yeshua, after his resurrection, goes to Kepha, who denied him three times, and asks him three times, do you love me? Feed my sheep, shepherd my flock, feed my lambs. Mm. He was reinstating, and it's a picture for all of us, because by our own, we've all sinned and fallen short, and we've all denied our master through our works of depravity. But yet in his resurrection and his love for us, in his death and resurrection, he comes and restores. But he does ask us a question when we confess him. Do you love me? In other words, will you be about my business? That business is my sheep. And the talents and giftings we're given in the field is how we feed, shepherd, and take care of his sheep and his lambs. Because there's some younger ones, there's some older ones. And we all have a role to play with the talents and gifts that we've been given, like the minas. Don't say we don't want that one to rule over us. No, let your will be done. This is how we operate in the field, bearing one another's burdens, not off to a place with dry, muddied wells that we, makes us feel good, tickling the ears. So Yosef is now on a journey. He, now he goes. He's on his way to Dothan. His brothers see him. And they said, here's this dreamer of dreams. Let's kill him. Such hatred in their heart. Because then we see in the renewed writings, well, our master tells us, you've heard that it was said, do not murder. But I tell you, he who already is wrought with his brother in his heart has already committed it. So they already had committed the act of murder in their heart. That's where they were just wanting to, to just actually physically work it out now. You know? And so they started to mock him. Oh, here comes this dreamer of dreams. How many of you have been mocked because of the walk that you're on by people who once knew you in your old way of life? Now you're the renewed man. Or, you know, when I say man in Messiah, it's male and female. The renewed person going and bringing good report, and then they mock you. Oh, what's that tit tit you're wearing? What's those things, the girly things? You know, whatever. These th people mock you for the smallest things, you know. Why are you growing a beard suddenly? What are you doing? Why this? Whatever. And people that you think, hey, yes, you, I'm coming to share my good news with you, and you get mocked. And that's what people will do for right, against you for righteousness' sake. And Matthew 27, verse 31, it says, when they mocked him, they took the robe. Remember they put a purple robe on him and said, oh, sovereign, and put a crown of thorns on him and started beating Messiah. When they took the robe off him, then he then put his own garments on and led him away to be impaled. So they also mocked our master. They wanted to throw Yosef into the pit. And so we see, as I said, it's possible that this is one of the two wells of Dothan and a pit is not a, a, a water well, it's a pit, it's an empty well, one that's dried up. And isn't that what the sources of falsehood have done? They're so dried up, there's no nourishment in them. You might as well be eating dirt, you know. And so they come up with this plan to say, let's throw him in the pit and just leave him. And we'll say some wild, take his robe, this special robe that's caused a lot of hatred and envy. Mm. Let's now see what happens to this dreamer of dreams. You know, it shows they had no insight into covenant at this stage. Reuben comes and tries to rescue Yosef. As firstborn, we know he's lost his firstborn status by defiling his father's bed, mm. but he's still taking as the oldest, coming and saying, no, let's not do this. Mm. Can't do this. Rather just leave him in the pit. But don't kill him. I mean, that's already, you know, two wrongs don't make a right. <laughs> but what we see here is a clear picture here in the story of Reuven, because what happens is Reuven gets them to agree, let's not kill him, just put him in a pit and let's all, you know, and, and say we don't know what happened to him or take the robe and say a wild beast must have killed him. But don't kill him. He, he tried to preserve his life. And that's possibly why the blessing by Moshe to Reuven was let Reuven live. Because he'd already, by his actions, he should not have lived. He should have been put to death because defiling his father's bed. All of us deserve death. But in the master, we've received life and life abundantly. 
And so when our master comes in his resurrection power and we choose to serve him through immersion in his name, he's declaring over us, let whatever your name is live. And it's by his word he gives us that power, not only just to live, but to live abundantly with the good news. Amen. And so in a sense, Reuben rescued him, but they stripped, Yosef was stripped and sold for silver. And when they saw uh, um, that he came near, they took off his garment. This is a picture again. The soldiers of the governor took Yeshua into the court, gathered the entire company of soldiers around him. And having stripped him, they put a scarlet robe on him, plating a crown of thorns, put it on his head and a reed in his hand and kneeled down before him and mocked him, saying, Greeting, sovereign of the Yehudim. That's from the account in Matit Yahu. Earlier I read one verse from Lucas. Matit Yahu 27. So we see so many shadow pictures of our master in Yosef's life, being mocked, being ridiculed, being beaten, being hated by his own. And Yosef being thrown into a dry pit or well is a classic picture of the, the church today, as well as rabbinic Judaism, as being the two muddy wells, so to speak. You know, because the one denies Messiah, rejects their own seed, the other has cast away the Torah and saying, we don't need that. Let's throw that away. Let's throw the covering of the Torah away. The deliberate teachings of Christianity and rabbinic Judaism set aside the living waters by delivering their own man-made dogmas that have muddied the waters to the point, well, you put any mud in water, it's not good, you know. They're simply muddied waters that have dried up the necessity to walk in the Torah and adhere to it, not only guard the commands, but bear the witness of Yeshua Messiah. So we see that this is the true set apart ones are at the living source, the water of life, where they're guarding the commands and the witness of Yeshua. If you are trying to guard the commands line upon line, line upon line, but don't have the witness and revelation of who Yeshua is, you're just like a dried up well. Your feet are in the mud. If you are claiming to bear witness of Yeshua and his resurrection, but have cast aside the commands and the Torah to walk in them, your feet are in the mud. It's on clay ground, mud, that's going to sink. Your feet are not on the rock of your deliverance. What the traditions and dogmas of man have done have dried up the living waters, the very thing our master came to restore, access to again by his own blood. Zechariah 9 verse 11 is a fitting text for us when we read about Yosef and the shadow picture of our master because it says also you because of the blood of your covenant I shall send your prisoners out of the pit because of the blood of the lamb we are able to be brought out and delivered from being prisoners to the pit of death he rescues us from the pit of Sheol and we were all thrown into that pit of destruction because of sin and lawlessness. You know what's quite a fitting picture here is that Yosef's brothers, they throw him into a pit. Picture the scene. Try and, you know, it's almost like, I don't know how big the pit is, but it's certainly big enough to throw him in and he can't get himself out. Okay? So it's a deep well, similar to what Yirmiyahu would have been thrown into. When they didn't like the words, the sovereign threw him into the, the well. You know? A dried up, muddy pit. Because in the days of Yirmiyahu, nobody was really doing what the master had commanded. And so they rejected the authority of his words as through, given through his prophets. So here they throw Yosef into the well, then they sit down and have a meal. It's like, eh, nothing's, eh, this is fine. They're not even gripped with guilt. Think about that. It seems a little cold when you think about it, but shadow picture forward. I like to use the word shadow picture you gathered. But, but go forward and you see, what about the day? We've just been through a season and we're in the season of counting, but Pesach and Matzot, when Yeshua was de delivered up for execution, there would be many who would have religiously eaten the Pesach meal the night after he was impaled because they were doing the religious duty and not seeing the one that they had impaled is actually what this Pesach meal is about. Carrying on as normal because they refused to listen to the voice of the prophets. 
And obviously, if they refuse to listen to the prophets, they're not going to listen to Messiah himself, you know. So while they were eating, here comes a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilad with spices, balm, and myrrh. And here we see again a picture of what took place at Messiah's burial. All these products picture for us the relevant materials that was used in Messiah's burial. And in Yosef's line, we also see through the son of Manasseh, a wonderful power picture of what he went through in shadow picturing what Messiah would do for us. Why I say that? A genealogy of, of Manasseh is as follows. If you want to make notes of the names, Manasseh, Yosef means he adds or increases. Okay, because he was fruitful. So he adds, he increases. Manasseh means causing to forget. Now, Manasseh had a son, Machir, which means soul. Machir had a son, Gilad, which means rocky region. Gilad had five sons. First was Iezer, which means no help, because Ezer means help. Iezer means no help. Chelek means portion. Asriel means I shall be prince of El. Shechem, which we've spoken about, back or shoulder. And Hefer, a well. Hefer had a son, Tselofchad. Remember, Tselofchad had five daughters. Tselofchad means firstborn, because he was the firstborn of Hefer. Now, when you look at this line of Manasseh, and just in the meaning of names, as a list of descendants from Yosef to Manasseh's line going to the firstborn of Hefer, we see the following through their meanings of the names. He is increased and caused to forget how he was sold in the rocky region with no help. While his portion was to be the prince of El who would bear the burden by being brought up out of the pit as firstborn from among the dead. So we see one in, in a small little genealogical line, history, we see powerful witness of the work of our master. You know, rejected by his own. Yehuda then con convinced his brothers not to kill Yosef. So he said, okay, let's not kill him. We can make it some bucks here. We can make a deal, you know. And so his blood was on their hands no matter what. But now let's not kill him because, you know, he's going to go sold into to these Yishmaelites. The Midianite traders come along. In those days, the Midianites were the middleman. They would do the deal, you know, and negotiate and make sure a transaction was done. So they sold him for 20 pieces of silver. Now, years later, this would become the price of a male from five years old to 20. From 20 years old to 50, it would be... 50 shekels, but for a female from 20 years old to 50, the atonement price would be 30 shekels of silver. That's why Yeshua was sold for 30 shekels of silver, because he paid the atonement price for us, his bride. You know? Reuven, where did he go? I don't know. Maybe he went back to the casino at Dothan. I'm not sure. Thought he had his brothers intact. Okay, we're not going to kill him. I can carry on doing my business. Because by all accounts, the character, character of Reuben was to not be about the father's business as well. So he probably thought, okay, I've saved him. I'll go off wherever I was. And when he came back, Yosef was gone. What are we going to do now? You know? And so he started panicking. And this is what will happen when you just do not do what's right. You start to panic when things aren't going the way you thought it would happen. And he was more concerned about what he'd have to now say to his father than actually having lost his younger brother. This is a picture of so, how so many people would have an outward show of repentance, yet their hearts are still hardened by deceit. The book of Yoel 2 verse 13, it says, And tear your heart and not your garments. And turn back to Yahweh your Elohim, for he shows favor and is compassionate, patient and great in kindness, and he shall relent concerning the evil. How awesome this is that when we can truly take our hearts a broken spirit and a contrite heart our master will not deny. But when you are not taking your heart to the master, putting on an outward show, taking your heart to the master is seen in the fruit of your life by bearing the fruit of repentance, by showing you're not that way anymore. That's when the compassion and kindness and favor of our master can be poured out lavishly. He will love you spontaneously. We spoke about that return. Take words with you. Render the bull of your lips. In other words, it's not just words on the lips, but it's a heart and mouth that confesses the master. And the actions thereafter is a changed life. That's what our master wants. That's, that's where he wants to give his favor and compassion to.
In an act of desperation and a clearly wicked scheme, they take the long robe that was Yosef's, they dip it in a, um, the blood of a male goat that they had slaughtered. They probably ate the goat, you know. And when they took it back to his father, they said, we found this robe, we're not sure who, you know, I mean, lie after lie after lie. He recognized it immediately because he made that robe for his son. And he weeps, he weeps for his son. He must have thought, you know, Yaakov, as we learn, as I said through scripture, when we often see Moshe referring to Yaakov as Yaakov, it's often in that wrestling, insecure state. When we see him being referred to as Yisrael, it's that confident, authoritative role of deliverer, of, of being in deliverance in, before the master's face, you know. So Yaakov had now been deceived by his sons, by the blood of the coverings of his garment, and so he basically takes us back to how Yitzchak, or Yaakov had deceived Yitzchak when wearing a goat's garment, when he went to, you know, get the blessing of his father. And so he just cries out, Yaakov is torn to, or Yosef is torn to pieces, torn to pieces. Mm. This is a powerful picture. That this word for torn, tzaraf, is also used in Hosea 6 verse 1. It says, come and let us turn back to Yahweh, for he has torn us, but he does heal us. He has stricken, but he binds us up. Mm. You see, yes, we, we've been torn because we've been torn away from him through sin and lawlessness. Because even Adam and Chava were torn away, but he gave a covering. He's the one that binds. He, he's the one that binds the sheaves together by his blood. He's the one that brings us all together if we will respond correctly. Anybody want to share their thoughts on Yosef's dreams, his brother's actions, and how we can see the shadow pictures of our master's work in this flesh, bringing about a covering for us of royalty and deliverance that we can work out, having put off the old, rendering our hearts as torn before the master so he can bind up and heal and establish his written word therein that we can walk in and bear witness of the true living waters, the expectation of Israel. Anything you want to share? No? Yeah, I mean, just the agreement was, obviously you've got 12 sons, some of them are going to be shepherds, some are going to stay yeah. at home helping you there. They have different roles. You do need to treat them the same. So yes. But I mean, also, like you say, if they weren't doing anything wrong, they wouldn't have felt the need to try and hide. Or if you live your life in a way where you know you're not, I think, not standing behind the door, okay, and you can, you don't have to worry what people say yeah. about you. Yeah. No, there isn't substance to the. Yes. Yeah. You know. Sure. So they obviously you had something to hide. Yeah. The fact that. Yeah. Which we know. I mean, we know the, the other parts now. But okay, who do I? He sent him to say, go and put him in that position. Yes. I mean, every time, go tell me what your brothers did. <laughs> it's like a. <laughs> catch 22. Yeah. I don't know where 22 comes from, but catch 22. You know. No matter how you turn it. No matter how you turn it, you just got to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to do. <laughs> Somebody's, more often than not, somebody's going to be upset with what you're doing when you're just doing what you should be doing. You can never please everyone. Yeah. So you must decide who you want to please. Yeah, because we see in the renewed writings that we are to be pleasers of Elohim and not pleasers of men. You know, and it's not, our, it's not that we go out to be displeasers of men, but we first and foremost make sure that we are always doing what's pleasing to Yahweh. And his pleasing desire for us is set apartness. And it will be pleasing to some and it will be displeasing to others. But we don't change our garments based on the company we keep. You know? I just wanted to share with you. Yeah. Um, no, I just wrote down where I was. Yeah. Sorry. As you can, uh, Jacob had plenty of experience before and certainly followed Yahweh and learned from his mistakes. Certainly, Yosef reporting his brothers to his father could be an act of immaturity, and he still wrestled out things between flesh and spirit. But in one way, Yosef might have been special to him because he reflects Yaakov's youth, being a tent dweller and following the ways of Yahweh, and his brother Esau being a man of the field. Yosef was also learning and following in the ways of Yahweh, being taught by Yaakov, 
the Nike's brothers who do not completely follow in their father's teachings. This, this could also be a reason why Yaakov bought the way of Yosef's dreams, because he knew and understood Yahweh and his ways, and knew that Yahweh works in mysterious ways. Yahweh is in control completely, and it was necessary for a prophecy to come forth through a set apart and upright prophet of Yahweh through Yosef's dreams in order to turn their brother's ways back to righteousness and Yahweh's Torah because these are the children of Israel who were chosen to be a light to the nations who do not regard Yahweh's Torah. But Yosef certainly was capable and he understood that age is just a number and when the word of Yahweh comes to you, you act on it no matter your age. Because the consequences of not acting on your ship could lead to Yahweh rejecting you as a living stone to build up the house and raise someone else up to bring forth his word. I think Jeremiah could have certainly learned from something from Yosef. But I just want to read from Jeremiah, it says, um, from Jeremiah 1 verse uh, 6 to 8. And said, I, I must be Yahweh. I do not know how to speak, for I am a youth. And Yahweh said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, but go to all to whom, to whom I sent you, and speak whatever I command you. Do not fear their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, declares Yahweh. We have a role to play, as I said earlier. When it's when we know we need to speak up, we need to speak up. You know. Yeah, I think the point is with you must have the zeal, but sometimes you need the maturity too. Yes. In your zeal, in your ignorance, you can yeah. come across a certain way which wasn't meant. Yeah. Uh, Renee just asked Shalom. Where does it? say Reuven lost, loses his inheritance exactly. I know where it's written he defiles the bed, but where does it say he loses his, his inheritance or his birthright? If we look at 1 Chronicles 5 verse 1, it says, As for the sons of Reuven, the firstborn of Israel, he was the firstborn, but because he profaned his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Yosef, sons of Israel. Son of Israel, so that the genealogy is not listed according to the birthright. For Yehuda prevailed over his brothers, and from him came a ruler, although the birthright was Yosef's. So you can just see the. So actually, Yosef received the birthright, but then we also see Yehuda prevailed over his brothers, and so we see a powerful picture at that time why Yehuda and Binyamin at that stage, which we go through the story of Yosef, where the, ori the origin of the two houses actually were birthed in type during the, the life of Yosef, you know. So I hope that answers you, Renee. Thank you, he says. Okay, who'd like to read chapter 38? Yeah, Yehuda's wanderings. And it came to be that Yehuda left his brothers and turned aside to a man and a Dulamite whose name was Hira. And Yehuda saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Er. And she conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Unan. And she conceived again and bore a son, and called his name Shelah. And he was at Kezi when she bore him. And Yehuda took a wife for Er, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Er, Yehuda's firstborn, was evil in the eyes of Yahweh, and Yahweh took his life. And Yehuda said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and marry her, and raise up an heir for your brother. And Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. And it came to be, when he went into his brother's wife, that he spilled on the ground, lest he should give an offspring to his brother. But what he did displeased Yahweh, so he took his life too. <clears throat> then Yehuda said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah is grown. For, he said, lest you also die as his brothers did. And Tamar went and dwelt in, dwelt in her father's house. And after a long time the daughter of Shua, Yehuda's wife, died. And Yehuda was comforted and went up to his sheep, sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. And it was reported to Tamar, saying, See, your father-in-law is coming up to Timnah to shear his sheep. 
And she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat at the entrance of Enaim, which is on the way to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given to him as a wife. And Yehuda saw her and reckoned her for a whore, for she had covered her face. And he turned aside to her by the way and said, Please let me come in to you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What do you give me to come in to me? And he said, Let me send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, Do you give me a pledge until you send it? And he said, What pledge should I give you? And she said, Your seal and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. And he gave them to her and went into her and she conceived by him. And she arose and went away and removed her veil and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Yehuda sent the young goat by the hand of his friend the Adulamite to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he did not find her. And he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the cult prostitute who was beside the way to Enaim? And they said, There is no cult prostitute in this place. And he returned to Yehuda and said, I have not found her. And the men of the place also said, There it was no cult prostitute in this place. And Yehuda said, Let her take them for herself, lest we become despised. For I sent this young goat, and you have not found her. And it came to be about three new moons after that Yehuda was informed, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has hoard. And see, she has conceived by hoarding. And Yehuda said, Bring her out, and let her be burned. When she was brought out, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, Please examine whose these are, the seal and the cord and the star. And Yehuda examined and said, She has been more righteous than I, because I did not give her to Shelah my son, and he never knew her again. And it came to be at the time of giving birth, that see, twins were in her womb. And it came to be when she was giving birth, that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand, saying, This one came out first. And it came to be, as he drew back his hand, that see, his brother came out. And she said, How did you break through? This breach be upon you. So she, so his name was called Peretz. And afterwards his brother came out who had the scarlet thread on his hand, so his name was called Zerah. Okay, so after Yosef is now sold uh, into slavery, ya uh, Yehuda leaves his brothers and he goes, he turns aside to Adullam or to an Adullamite. And so we see a, repeatedly through scripture, we see the kind of language it's used because we're told that he went down to Yarat or he went down or he left. The word that's translated as left is Yarat, which means to go down. So in scripture, we always see going down to Mitzrayim, going down, as opposed to the, the picture of going up and ascending to Yerushalayim or to the master. So we see that this journey, this chapter, which highlights a bit of a detour in Yehuda's life, is a clear picture of a downward spiral and a path that actually was headed for destruction. You know, so he turned aside. In other words, we're told to walk in the Torah, not turn to the left or to the right. So we see this picture that we get here of turning aside. They've just sold their brother into slavery. Prophetically, it's a picture of rejecting Messiah in type, the one who is to rule over you, you know. And we see the, the, the root word for turned aside, nata, means to spread out, incline. It's also used to be a reference to branches which we know a branch spreads out from a tree. Mm -hmm. So when our master, and from this root verb, we get the word um, mata, which is a rod, because a rod would be made from a branch that stretches out from a tree. So you understand why all these words come together. And it can also mean a branch of a vine or a tribe. A mata is also reference to a tribe, because a tribe is that which branches out from a genealogy. Yeshua tells us in Yochanan 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who stays in me and I in him bears much fruit, because without me you are, you are able to do naught. But if you don't bear fruit, your branch will be cut off and thrown into the fire. So Yehuda is a metaphoric picture here of those who have denied Messiah. As a shadow picture in text and a mirror to us, this is a picture of those. It means praise. So they think they're praising the Father, but they've denied 
Messiah, who came in the flesh. And so they've not remained in the truth, but have run after the things of the flesh. They've turned aside, mm. turning away from the truth. Yehuda had spread out his branch, but in the wrong way, so to speak. And so he, d- he didn't stay in the truth. Why? Because the fruit of his actions reveals a whole lot. He got unevenly yoked with a Canaanite woman. I mean, it would have been clear growing up as sons of Yaakov. Why did Yaakov leave Canaan in the first place? Mm. You know, and then got Rachel and Leah and Bilhah and Zilpah. It's so he wouldn't take one of the daughters of Canaan. So Yehuda goes and he takes a daughter of Canaan, you know. And so in Shemot 23, verse 2, it says, Do not follow a crowd to do evil, nor bear witness in a strife, so as to turn aside after many, to turn aside what is right. Again, that's the root word nata, which is to be turned aside. By Yehuda turning an aside, Uh, turning aside to an Adulamite, it's a picture of turning aside from Yahweh's justice and right rulings to man's. Why? Because Adulamite, which in Hebrew is Adulami, means justice for the people. Hmm. Now, it was a cave in Adulam that uh, that David went to take refuge in for a while, and then 400 men came and gathered together and submitted to David at the cave of Adullam. And that, again, is a picture, again, of David, the beloved king, coming to bring justice for the people in a time when they were trying to kill him. But going down here, we see a, a, a picture given to us in Scripture of when you turn aside from Yahweh's way, you are naturally then turning aside to man's way, you know? And so Yehuda's actions are a picture of what so many people are doing today as they turn aside to man's system of justice rather than obeying the the Torah of Yahweh. And it's the picture that we see right through the history of Israel when they had no sovereign during the time of the judges, everyone doing what was right in their own eyes. Yahweh would raise up a judge, would be fine for a number of years, even up to 40 years at times, 20 years, 40 years, whatever. Then as soon as that judge dies, they all go and they do what they want again. You know, uh, Moshe warned the generation about to enter into the promised land, do not do as we're doing here today, each one doing what is right in his own eyes. We need to be following Yahweh's orders in unity of his spirit. Because when everyone's doing whatever they want, it's chaos. It, It doesn't gel, you know. When people reject the Torah, they resort to doing what's right in their own eyes. When they reject authority, they think, well, I'll do what I want. Don't tell me what to do. Who made you judge and rule over? Who made you leader? Who made you this? You know? And this is what happens today. Yosef had been cast aside. Yehuda decides, I'm leaving you guys. You go, I don't even know if he went back with his brothers to tell the father. But anyway, he turned aside and he went away. Perhaps after seeing his father's grief, he thought, well, I'm not going to be here anymore. I'm going away. And so we see a a powerful picture here. Yehuda might have realized the wickedness that he'd actually been part of in his actions against Yosef. And his guilt caused him to turn aside to an alternative situation and place, thinking, if I can escape this, I'll feel better. You know, isn't that what so many people do today when in the mirror of the word highlights something that needs to be changed in their lives? They don't want to change, so what do they do? They go somewhere else where they feel, well, nobody's going to tackle me on this, so I'll just do whatever I want. Or they isolate themselves and say, as long as I'm not in the assembly, nothing's going to be exposed. You know? Yeshiyahu 29 verse 22 says, Therefore thus said the master Yahweh, who ransomed Avraham concerning the house of Yaakov, Yaakov is no longer put to shame. No longer does his face grow pale. What we see here, why I'm saying that is because he turned aside to an Adulamite, and the Adulamite's name was Chira. Now, Chira means a noble race coming from a root verb, Chavar, which means to grow pale. And the only other time we see this word being used in Scripture as a verb is in the one that I just read from Yeshiyahu. So in other words, he, he ran away. He turned aside, and in, in a sense... Growing pale is he's losing life because when somebody's growing pale, you can see they're sickly. You know, they're they're not well, they're not healthy. Again, showing how the envy had caused rottenness in the bones. He was starting to actually fade away because of turning aside. This is a dangerous witness of what we see in the last days, many falling away. 
turning aside to myths and false teachings. Yehuda had now joined himself with that which he shouldn't have. He wasn't supposed to go join himself to the Canaanites. And we are warned in Scripture not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. He saw a daughter of a Canaanite, took her for himself, and she was the daughter of a Canaanite whose name was Shua, which means wealth, perhaps a wealthy guy, I don't know. Once again, it's a picture as a lesson for us of how many are turning away from walking in the Torah because they're chasing wealth. So when it comes to the matters of chasing wealth and the, and the deceit of wealth, you know, worries of this life and the deceit of wealth, wealth in itself can be a blessing from Yahweh. But the deceit of that, causing people to fix their eyes on that, takes their eyes off the Torah. They turn aside from meditating on the Torah day and night. And all they're thinking about day and night is how they can make their next successful, wealthful transaction or the thing that's going to get them out of everything. If you're consumed with your focus on that, you're not focused on the word, because the word will direct your steps if you let it, if your feet are secure in the head, you know. So he's, in a sense, a picture of chasing after now the materialistic wealth. Why? Because he was running away from guilt and the actual submission to just do what's right. When you start to do what's right, it might cost you a whole lot. You might lose everything. Shaul says, I consider everything rubbish for the sake of knowing your sure Messiah. But then you will start to grow. No longer grow pale through fear and panic and worry and, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Shortness of breath, stress levels going, the worries and choking out the word. Because if you think choking out the word, you're losing life, you're growing pale. But now in the master, you can be strengthened, you know. Yehuda married into money, so to speak, because that's really what his focus was on. Because now I've left my father's house, I've turned aside, I need, to, I need to focus on establishing my way, because then maybe I can go back. Isn't that what a lot of people do? No, when I first make it, then I'll start serving Yahweh correctly. I know I should do this, I know I should do that, but I'm first going to do focus. I've, you don't, I've got to, my mind is so focused on that that I don't have time for the word. That's a Yehuda turning aside picture that leads you to be joined unequally to things, people, or businesses that will actually do you more harm than good. But yet it's presented as a rosy picture, you know. The desire of riches and wealth has a way of causing many to turn aside and walking out of Yahweh and not walking in his right rulings anymore. Yehuda's sons, I mean, here his sons that are born to him are wicked, they're not interested in building up a history and a genealogy. First son, Er, means awake, arouse, expose. Onan means strong or vigorous. And Shelach means a petition, or Shelah, I mean petition or prosperity. So in other words, we see here, even in his naming of his children, there's this arousal and strong desire to chase wealth. So you can already see what was the focus in his mind, you know. And so when the daughter of Shua bore Shelah, Yehuda was in Keziv, it means false. So we see a lot, a lot of things here. He was not where he was really supposed to be. He was living in falsehood. And so this is a picture again of false worship or the prosperity gospel. And people try to use the word to gain wealth. And that's what Yahweh hates. You know, Yehuda's, Yehuda took a wife of, uh, for his firstborn, and she, her name was Tamar. And we know the story of Tamar because we know he tried to execute the Torah. Now he's saying when Yahweh struck his firstborn because he was evil, he said to the secondborn, raise up a seed for your brother. He was just as evil, said, no, then I don't have inheritance, so I'll just enjoy Tamar. You know, fleshly lusts. So Yehuda, in a sense, was trying to apply aspects of the Torah. But when, you're not, when you've turned aside from fully walking in the Torah, little aspects aren't going to help you. You know? So Tamar is abused. Then he said, okay, wait till the younger one grows up. So there's a number of years that he's living. Because this story is not necessarily exactly chronological to then the next chapter, which we get of Yosef's life in Mitzrayim. Just hear and understand. There's an event that took place. Then we look at a record of the departure of Yehuda. Then we come back. Let's get back to Yosef. That's how it's structured. Okay. And so we see here that she grows up. Now, Tamar understood something that must have been from Yehuda's language, there's, there's a covenant, there's a, 
there's a covenant that his family is part of, and I want to be part of that. You know, I want to raise up the seed. And so Yehuda forgot all about his youngest son, Shuva. And I mean, I don't know how much younger or whatever he was than Tamar, but he obviously, she waited a while and saying, listen, I'm going to get passed away of women. You know, I need to also bring about seed. And she disguised herself. Everything in this chapter is not good, <laughs> in a sense, yeah. you know, and the actions that were taken out. But Tamar is listed in the genealogy of Messiah because it was the promised seed from Yehuda that Yahweh already had as a promised provision where he would bring forth Messiah. So Tamar dresses up as a cult prostitute. Now what we have to take note of here is that when we think of this term cult prostitute, you have to understand in those days, in those nations, it doesn't make it right, cult prostitutes were held in high regard. You know, in actual fact, the Hebrew word for whore, zana, is not the word that's used for cult prostitute here. It's actually, it's referred to as a set-apart one. You know, a, a kedasha is the word that's used for cult prostitute, and it would be used for uh, male or female in a sense of Israel was told not to become cult prostitutes because to the nations, it was a position of high regard, especially in their sexual fertility worship. So in the eyes of the people, it wouldn't have been, in the people of Adullam, it wouldn't have been something bad for Yehuda to take a cult prostitute. I mean, in the eyes of covenant people, yes, it's bad. Because you should not let your daughter or your son become cult prostitutes. They'll be put to death. So Yehuda, anyway, he, she disguises herself as this. And, but now as a guarantee and as a pledge, she says to him, what are you going to give me? He said, I'll give you a goat. No, 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 whatever, I need to... Who you know you're going to send for a goat, but what do I keep in the meantime as a pledge? Yeah. And the Hebrew word uh, uh, for pledge highlights a, a lesson for us of the pledge that we have been given in our inheritance by the Spirit, given as a pledge to us, almost as a as a seal, as something that secures us in knowing that we have a and I we have something that secures for us the promise that is that is to come. You know, and. We see the pledge that Tamar asks for is, this, is uh, Yehuda's seal, his staff, and his rod. His, sorry, staff and rod, same thing, Patrick. You almost confused me. His seal, his cord, and his rod or staff. Okay. Now the Hebrew word for seal is chotham, which means a seal or a signet or a ring, a signet ring. And the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were to be engraved on Shoham stones on the high priest's garments, the engraving like the engraving of a signet, like a signet ring, a chotham. And the plate of clean gold that was on the turban of the high priest were also to be engraved with the words, Kodesh la Yahweh, set apart to Yahweh, or set apartness to Yahweh, like the engraving of a signet. So we see, we see a powerful picture here of our master has impressed upon us his desire, which is his set-apartness, by his spirit. The Hebrew word for cord is pathil, which means a cord, a thread, or a string. Now, it would typically be used to attach something to the garment of the high priest, like the breastplate. We see that the, um, it would have been cords that have been twisted together, now, this is the same word that's used for the cord of blue that is to be in the tzitzit or the tzitzit or the tassel of our garments. Also, it was a cord, the pathil, that was used to bind the breastplate to the rings of the ephod on the high priest. So we look at these things and then we understand, okay, then you've got the staff, which is mata, which means a staff, a rod, a, 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 it also represents a tribe, as I said just now, mata, um, also represents a scepter or spear, because you can think of the a spear or a rod coming from a branch, etc., etc. But what the mata or the rod or the staff highlights is the authority of the one in whose hand it is. And it represents, and, 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 represents by her asking for his rod that she would be able to identify whose authority that she had submitted herself to. Mm. 
Sheep under the hand of the shepherd's staff have the assurance that the shepherd would lead them to green pastures. And his, this picture is the comfort that we have in the assurance of our master. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your rod and your staff, it comforts me. There's no rod and staff, it's the same thing. It's just poetic language giving the comfort of that we can take hold of it and we have his authority, we have his protection and understanding it taking it in, in, you take a rod or a staff in your hand, it means that you are submitting to work obedience to the authority of the one that you're taking hold of, mm -hmm. clinging to our master, the right hand of authority over our lives. Yehuda was willing to give these to Tamar, which shows us a great picture how he was willing to give all he was, he wasn't hiding from her saying, oh, let's not, don't let anybody know who you are, mm. you know. Sorry? No, he didn't know who she was. But what I'm saying is he wasn't afraid to, for a cult prostitute to say, this is, this is who, who this belongs to, you know. Mm. And as I said, the Greek word, or the, I didn't say, the, the word for seal in Hebrew is ara, arabon, and, or aravon. And the Greek word is arabon. And we see in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 21 to 22, this is translated as a pledge, where it says, but he who establishes us with you in Messiah has anointed us, is, and has anointed us is Elohim, who has sealed us and gave the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Okay. As a seal and a securing of, of who we are, you know, the, one thing that we take note of, that when we walk by the Torah of Yahweh and bearing the witness of Yeshua Messiah, his, his spirit bears witness that it's his spirit that seals us, giving us the pledge. So when he comes, we can say, see, we are yours. And the rod highlights the authority that we're under. The cord, as we put in our tzitzits, why do you think it's in Numbers 15 verse 38? Now, for some, this might seem line upon line. And when you say line upon line, don't tell me this. I've heard it before. I don't need to do it. When it says, speak to the children of Israel. Now, all of us here, we understand covenant. Are we all children of Israel? Because if you're not, or you're not sure if you are, we need to talk some serious business. You know? And you shall say to them, all the children of Israel, it's not just the males. But when a collective of male and female is being addressed, it's addressed in the masculine. That's how the Hebrew language works. There are some out there that say women don't need to wear tzitzits because it's only for the males. Okay. This children, banim, is the masculine form of children used to direct the message to all children, male and female. And the command is to make tzitziot on the corners of their garments throughout their generations. And what do you do with the tzitziot that you put on your garments? You put a blue pathil, a blue cord, a cord that's twisted in the tzitzit of the corners, on the fringes, on the edges. Okay, our garments are slightly different today. So we, you know, sometimes we attach it around our belts or things like that. But notice you don't just put one tzitzit on. It's tzitziot, it's plural. Some of us use two, some four, etc. But you, you do have the plurality of that. And it's for all children. It's not a suggestion. This is a command. And the blue cord highlights authority. As we understand, the blue represents the witness of the, 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 the skies, the heavens, and the earth, the sea, and also the sapphire under <coughs> sapphire pavement under the throne of Elohim, representing the authority. What does the muddied well, the dried up well of rabbinic Judaism do today? They exclude the blue cord. And therefore they make their tzitziot long, as the master said, and their tefillin wide. Meanwhile, they, have, they rejected Messiah. So we are children of Israel. Therefore, one of the outward expressions that we have is wearing the tzitziot on the fringes of our garments with a blue cord in it. It can be other colors too, but blue is a commanded requirement that needs a blue thread needs to be in there, in that tassel, tassels that you put on your garments. 
And then when we have that, we can properly take up the rod of authority by walking in the commands, working righteousness, having the confidence that we walk by his spirit, his spirit seals us and gives us the pledge in our hearts, cleansing our conscience from dead works to serve the living Elohim in authority of his truth by obeying his word. When you're resistant to that, you're throwing down the rod, you're discarding and grieving the spirit. If you don't, I'll even say this, if you don't wear tzitzit, you're grieving the spirit. When you don't obey Yahweh, you grieve him. Not just with the tzitzit, I mean in everything, you know. So we see the shadow picture of what Tamar was asking for is the provision that our master's given us. He's given us his authority. He's given us his seal. And he's given us a dress code to show it. And complete set of partners that we are to... That when we wear titi, it reminds us not to rebel. Because you carry on reading... Uh, it was given after the people had rebelled against the authority, against the rod. Stubborn people. I know the word says this, but I'm not going to do it. That's rebellion. That, and rebellion is as witchcraft. So... Wearing tzitzit reminds us every single day who we are and the pledge of our inheritance that's been given to us. And wearing them just as an outward show to, you know, without true obedience is abominable disobedience. So we learn from these accounts that we do not take off our cord and do not put down the staff but uphold and guard the commands until our husband comes and finds them in our possession as a faithful, trustworthy bride. Mm -hmm. Yehuda then took Tamar to his home. When it was brought out, this daughter-in-law is your, yours is whored. She's pregnant. Bring her out and burn her. And when she brought these out, she said, then he said, she's been more righteous than I, because he forgot she, he should have given her to his third son, mm -hmm. you know. And so he took her home and never knew her again. In other words, he didn't lie with her again. He didn't have intercourse with her again, but he was taken into his home as his bride, and she would never have done any act of whoring in her life again. It was his daughter. Yeah, he, yeah it was his daughter, take, taken in as his daughter, but the seed would become his son. Didn't take her as his bride, but his daughter into his house under his covering and protection so that no one else could bring accusation against her to put her to death for their accusations of whoring. Mm -hmm. And we're reminded again of the story of the woman that was brought before the master by the religious lot, mm -hmm. claiming she was caught in adultery. And after all the interaction of writing their names in the sand, mm -hmm. he said, where's your accusers? He says, go sin no more. And it's one of the fundamental lessons that we take in our lives, in our bearing fruit worthy of repentance, is that we are no longer doing what we did when we were deserving of death. Tamar was delivered that day from the punishment of whoring, mm. you know, and being burnt. The fire represents the judgment that's coming. And when we are not being judged by our master's word now to receive a deliverance, we'll be judged by the fire of his wrath when he comes. If we are not found to have his cord, his staff, and his seal when he comes, that's why, you know what marks us? Our obedience to his Sabbath and feasts. So therefore we receive obedience as a sign on our hands because we've got his rod in our hands and his frontlets between our eyes, mm -hmm. set apartness to Yahweh because we're in him the head, our feet are secure in the head, our high priest and king. Mm -hmm. And then because of that, we obey him by putting blue, reminding us to obey and not rebel in the tassels that we put in our garments. Mm -hmm. Not worried what people say and how they'll mock us. What's those funny things on you? It, it now opens up the door for us to say, I'll tell you exactly what they are. Yes. Not be afraid to give a reason for the hope that you have in the master. How sure can you be in the hope that you have in the master when you don't wear titsi? A small example. Twins are born, Peretz and Zerach. Peretz sticks his hand out, gets a cord around it. Sorry, Zerach, sorry, sticks his hand out, yes. Gets a cord around his wrist, a scarlet thread, Pulls it, pulls it back, and then Peretz says, I'm coming out first. And his name means breakthrough or breach. 
He broke through and came out before his brother. Mm. And so we see the blessing given to Ruth in Ruth 4 verse 12 says, Let your house be like the house of Peretz, whom Tamar brought to Yehuda, of the seed which Yahweh does give you from this young woman. And so this was the blessing given to uh, Boaz and Ruth, you know, and making a clear witness, or sorry, yeah, yeah, as, as a witness of a returning bride being fruitful. And now our master is the repairer of the breach, giving us access to bear fruit and in him bear fruit abundantly. Mm. Both Tamar and Ruth are mentioned in the genealogy of Messiah, which is a statement of ident identity, a powerful one, being established in the line of Messiah. And in one sense, it's a picture of the redemption of the two houses that had hoard. Mm. You know, after the nations and had been restored in Messiah, the repairer of the breach. In one sense, you see Tamar representing the house of Yehuda coming back and Ruth representing the lost sheep of the house of Israel coming back. I know she was of, still of Yehuda, but it's a shadow picture of a return of those who have hoard away now coming back and being grafted into the covenants of promise by the blood of Messiah. And this scarlet thread tied to Zerach is also a picture of the arm of Yahweh rising to bring redemption as we see the thread of redemption right through the Torah and the prophets speaking of Messiah. You know, how even we see Rahav putting out the cord out the window when Israel would go into the promised land and Yerichu would be broken down except her dwelling. And she would be taken into the house of Israel. No, she, yeah, Ruth would become um, in the line of Ye Yehuda, sorry. No. Yeah. Yes, because Ruth also in the line of Yehuda. No. So we see a, a wonderful shadow picture in these events. Yehuda took a detour, and it shows us again how we all took a detour away from obedience because through one man all have sinned. Mm. But by his pledge, his spirit, his authority, his blood, he has provided a way back to be established as a people that do not whore again. Anybody want to share their thoughts on that? Okay. Yes, Patrick. Um, Yehuda, Yehuda and Tamar. Yes. Uh, I believe it, it was according to the purposes of Yahweh that he... He went into her and did whatever, and then because uh, in um, in the book of uh, the genealogy of Matthew, verse three, if they are recorded there. Mm -hmm. So I believe this whole thing was the, one of the purposes of Yahweh to get them together. But if Yahweh did it in that way, so that. That the line would continue. I think we must be careful when we border on saying that Yahweh planned disobedience. Mm. Yahweh works everything out for the good of those who love him and are called yeah. according to his purposes. Yes. But we've all fallen short of the esteem of Yahweh. We've all sinned and fallen short. Yehuda sinned. He shouldn't have taken a Canaanite woman. Yes. Yeah. But for the sake of Yahweh loving his loving commitment not being turned aside from Abraham, he preserved the seed. It wasn't his purpose for uh, Yehuda to go and take a foreign woman and have seed with her and be corrupted through his sons and then have seed with her, but he worked it out because of his loving commitment to the covenant he made with Abraham. That's the way we see it. And that's the good news is that Yahweh doesn't advocate us to go and purposefully sin and do wrong because he, he's purposed it. But when we turn back to him, he works everything out for the good of those who love him. So it's not that, oh, wow, yeah, he accepted all my wrong behavior. No. I mean, he put to, already by putting to death the first two born sons of Yehuda should have been a wake-up call for Yehuda. I shouldn't be in this place. But Yahweh worked a, a working that would get him to return to his brothers. He made it work out, Yes. So maybe, does that make sense? I'm hoping that we, yeah. we're not seeing that Yahweh had a purpose for, you know, a, Tamar to be a cult prostitute or present herself as one. He worked it out because Yehuda had gone astray, but he was bringing back, showing he will keep covenant alive.
Yeah, I just was going to say something that stood out for me as well. Um, something that you already mentioned, you know, that's not the act, it's the third thing. Mm. And it says in verse 12, And after a long time the daughter of Shua, Yehuda's wife, died, and Yehuda was comforted and went up to his sheep chairs at Timna. He and his friend Fira the Dulamite. And um, what I just see from this is that Yehuda was part of the seed of the promise. Yes. From Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be a light to the nations. And he considers a Dunamite, which is not part of Israel, as a friend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, it just reminds me of some um, references that I also just want to read. And besides the Canaanite woman that he took that he shouldn't have, he also considers the nation to be yeah. his friend. Yeah. You know, and just some references uh, in James 4 verse 4. Adulterous and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with enemy? Whoever therefore intends to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of the mm -hmm. enemy. And then he goes on Matthew 13, 22. And that son among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the warrior of his age and his, the seed of riches choke the word, and it becomes fruitless. Luke 4, verse 5 to 6. And the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the range of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I shall give you, and their esteem, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. And it says in Luke 14, 33, So then, every one of you who does not give up all that he has is unable to be my taught one. The Romans 12, verse 2, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you prove what is that good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of energy. 1 John 2, verse 15 to 17, do not love the world, nor that which is in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of our eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust of it. But the one, that, but the one doing the desire of the end remains forever. Amen. So we can learn so many valuable lessons. And I, and I don't understand why people say we don't need the Torah, because we look at the Torah and we see all these lessons that are so applicable for us today, you know. And so we, we can learn from Yehuda's departure that I think all of us can agree in our own lives, we started off from a departure point. Yes. <laughs> and how that's why a return is necessary. And the revelation of returning to what we never experienced as life becomes something that we now get to experience, but have to be on guard against turning aside or falling away. Because you can only turn aside and fall away when you've actually been in. And one of the warnings that we have now in Messiah is that if we turn away, having tasted the heavenly gift, that's what the book of Hebrews said, there is no other way. There is no other sacrifice. So how we have to be on guard with this pledge that we've been given, the authority that we've been given to obey his commands and bear the witness of Yeshua. Let's make sure that we never lose the zeal for that. You know? And we can see that in people's lives, people that were on the walk and they have walked away, they've become more disillusioned, more lost, uh, and further away. And sometimes, I mean, I've, I've had, I'll tell you later, uh, some someone who was here who um, has just gone back to, you know, thinking it's acceptable to call him Jesus and have his sage names on this name. And, you know, it's just so sad that they removed themselves so far from the, the root, the Torah, the foundation that was given us. Yeah. So they think it's been done away with. Yeah. I don't know if there's a way back to these people. Well, that's what I read the one verse earlier, that when you, t the turning aside of the simple, you know, it's, it's, it brings confusion in every foul deed because it really is just it. And you know what? When people are confused, that's what Babel means, confusion or ba Babel means confusion by mixing. And that's exactly almost every week, maybe every week. You can all tell me. You can go look at videos. You will. I think I'm mentioning somewhere along the line the, the warnings of mixing. Because it's one thing to come out, but then come out and be separate. And that means in word and in deed. Because people think, I'm not doing those things anymore, but they're bringing the words with them. And, and that mixing breeds confusion. And the confusion is not understood by the one being confused because they think they're right in their own eyes. And so then the standard of Yahweh is not upheld to the perfect standard of set-apartness. 
And therefore it says, let no corrupt word come out of your mouth. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name of Yeshua Messiah. And what we've come out from and identified as wrong, like you said, people fall away. And then after many years, it's, ah, yeah, it's not, don't be, you know, we had that zeal, but it really doesn't matter anymore. Mm. They lose that fire. And then things become acceptable again. Yeah, I'm in this walk now. Ach, yeah, does it really matter if they use false titles or false names? Or does it really matter if, you know, I go and join that guy on his birthday meal or Christmas celebration? I mean, it really goes to a stage where then they become like a depraved Israel in the days of Yirmiyahu, or Yehuda, sorry, in the days of Yirmiyahu, when they're going into the Hechel of Yahweh, and then they're going to the temple of Baal. Doing on the same day. I mean, we can equate that, that some think, okay, I'll do a bit of Sabbath things, but I'll also join my buddies on false worship. Ach, I'll join in. They know, you know, I don't agree. Or, or, you know, I'll go to their prayer group. Doesn't work. You can't mix. It's two different. Yahweh is not in a false prayer group. So why would you want to be there? So these are the things that people tend to fall away because it gets easier to deal with people when you're not standing up <laughs> for clear set of partners. And then that confusion and every foul deed starts to corrupt one to the point where you don't see the clarity and distinction between set apart and profane anymore and so that's the lesson that we can learn from the danger of turning aside you know like Yehuda's journey and and the compassion that Yahweh has in bringing us back must come with a clear desire to stay in him if things if walking in the word should not be burdensome it should be freedom Freedom from the confusion, freedom from the, I'm not sure. Not, it's actually when we come into the Word and why we meditate on this day and night and every week we go through the Torah and the prophets and renewed writings that we do, it's to establish in us the repetition of the joy of why we're doing this, you know. Well, when you talk about the pledge, you mentioned the verse where it says, Yahweh gave us the Spirit, the Ruach, as a pledge of our inheritance. And it says there, if you... Uh, the spirit, grieve. grieve the spirit, he can depart. Yes. Then you don't have that page of the inheritance yeah. anymore. And you're and left then, open. Yeah, and I mean, it's called the spirit of the truth too. Yes. So the minute the truth isn't pure in your heart anymore, that pledge isn't there anymore, yeah. and you're not guaranteed anything. You start wondering. Yeah. So we really, I mean, it's, it's very serious. You stay as clean as you can. <laughs> Because with little dots yeah. of dirt, then it's a slippery slope. Yeah. Okay, let's read chapter 39, going back to Yosef's journey. Just turn it there. And Yosef had been taken down to Mitzrayim, and uh, Potiphar, uh, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, a Mitzrayim uh, brought him uh, from the uh, Yishmaelites, Yish 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 <laughs> okay, who had taken him uh, down there. And it came to be uh, that uh, Yahweh uh, was uh, with Yosef, and uh, he uh, became prosperous man and uh, was in the house of his uh, masters, uh, the, the master of the Mitzrayim. And his uh, master saw that uh, Yahweh was uh, with him, and that uh, Yahweh made, uh, made all that he did to prosper in his hands. So Yosef found favor in the eyes, and uh, served him, and he appointed him over his house, and gave, uh, gave uh, into his hand all that he had. And it came to be uh, from the time that he appointed him over his house and all uh, that he had, that Yahweh blessed the Mitzrayim's uh, house for Yosef's sake. And the blessing of Yahweh was on all that he had in his house and in the field. And he uh, left Yosef's uh, hand, uh, but he left in Yosef's hands uh, all. Uh, that he had, and he did not know what he had except uh, for the bread which he ate. And Yosef had, uh, sorry, Yosef was handsome in form, 
and uh, handsome in appearance. And um, after these events, it came to be uh, that his master's wife lifted up her eyes on Yosef and said, Lie with me. But he refused and uh, said uh, to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know uh, what uh, is uh, with me in the house, and he has given into my hand all that he has. No one is greater in this house than I, and uh, he has not withheld uh, whatever from me but you. Because you are his wife, and how should I do this great evil and sin against Elohim? And it came to be, um, as she uh, spoke to Yosef day by day, uh, that uh, he did not uh, listen to her to, to lie with her, uh, to, to be with her. And it came to be on a certain day when Yosef went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house were inside, that uh, she uh, caught him by his garment, uh, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment uh, in her hand and uh, fled and ran outside. And it came to be that when she saw uh, that uh, he had left his garment in her hand and he f uh, and fled outside, that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them, saying, See, uh, he has uh, brought uh, in uh, to us a Hebrew to mock us. He has, uh, sorry, he came uh, in uh, to me to, to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it came to be that when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out, that he left his garment uh, with me and fled and went outside. And she kept uh, his garment uh, with her until uh, his master came home. Uh, she spoke uh, to, uh, to him uh, these uh, same words, uh, saying, The Hebrew servant uh, whom you brought uh, to us uh, came uh, to me to mock me. So it came to be, as I lifted uh, my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and uh, fled outside. And it came to be when his master heard these words uh, which his wife spoke uh, to him, saying, Your uh, servant uh, did to me according to these words uh, that uh, his uh, displeasure burned. Then Yosef's master uh, took him and put him uh, in the prison, a place where the sovereign, uh, sovereign's prisoners were confined, and uh, he uh, was there uh, in the prison. But uh, Yahweh was with Yosef and extended a loving commitment to him and gave him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. And the prison warden gave uh, into, uh, into the hands of Yosef all the prisoners whom were in the prison and whatever was done there uh, was uh, his doing. Uh, the prison warden uh, did not look uh, into any point that was under Yosef's hand, because Yahweh was with him, and whatever he did, uh, Yahweh made it prosper. Okay, so here we have the account of Yosef being sold into the house of Potiphar and showing Yahweh is with him. One of the key things that we see in this chapter is that despite Yosef's circumstances, whether he was put into head of the home or whether he was chucked into prison, Yahweh was with him. And that is such a valuable lesson. Yahweh was with Yosef. This is one of the most important things that we can take in this lesson is that because Yahweh is with us, we need not fear what man can do to us. But as Kaleen was saying, when we talk about the spirit of truth or the spirit of Yahweh, when you grieve the spirit, the spirit departs. So when we hold fast to the truth, we have the assurance that he is with us by his spirit. We have that, and it's by belief, you know. So we either are walking in this word and we have this confident belief, and then we're not shaken by the events. We still uphold the standard. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we see here is that this, the Hebrew word that's translated, I mean, at the end it said Yahweh made him prosper, and he prospered in the house. He made him a prosperous man. 
In Tehillah 1 verse 1 to 3, it says, Blessed is the man who shall not walk in the counsel of the wrong, nor sit or nor stand in the path of sinners, shall not sit in the seat of scoffers, but he, his delight is in the Torah of Yahweh. And he meditates in his Torah day and night, for he shall be as a tree planted by the rivers of water that yields its fruit in its season, and whose leaf does not wither, and whatever he does prospers. Same word, root word that's used for prospers or prosperous. And it comes from the root word talach, which means to advance, be successful, press through and succeed. So this isn't a monetary thing. Because when people hear prosperity, they think of money, riches, schemes, whatever it is, you know. And so what we see here is that the ways of Yahweh is what we are to be meditating on. When it says here, the blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wrong, it means you, you don't go do what the wrong tell you to do. Because walking is your actions, your way of walk. Our feet are secure in the head. So you're not doing what the wrong do. Standing in the path of sinners, we're not. We're on the higher way of set-apartness that no fool wanders on. So the path is your way, the way in which you walk. And standing in the path of sinners is joining with them, which Ricardo just read just now about having no friendship with the world, you know, and not sitting in the seat of scoffers. It's you're not sitting there and whispering and, 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 and using dibba, you know, the, the, the corrupt reasonings and gossipings and things like that. Or you're not going to those that are scoffing at the Torah and sitting down and reasoning with them and don't get into endless arguments over matters of the Torah. It's fruitless. Because the righteous man, blessed is the man that doesn't do that. Why? Because it won't be a blessing if you do any of those things. <laughs> because if you stand in the way of sinners or you walk in the path of the counsel of the wrong or you sit in the seat of scoffers, it's not going to be a blessing for you. But what do you do? But your delight is not in trying to win an argument with scoffers and sinners and fools and try and do what they do to appease your flesh. Your delight is in the Torah. And when your delight is in the Torah, you'll want to do everything that stems from Torah obedience. Meditating on it day and night, it doesn't mean you're walking around with it, I can't do anything because Craig told me I must read the Torah. What it means is every choice, every action that you're doing is coming from a foundation of the commands of our master. That you, And if you're not sure, you seek the word for it. You seek guidance. You seek counsel. In the in, there's wisdom in the counsel of many. Many what? Wise ones. Sealed ones. Not in the counsel of the wrong. I think the big mistake people make, which we trained in the wrong religions is that your religion and your life can be separated. When we learn that the Torah is a way of life. Yes. It's not a just worship because we're created to worship your heart. Yes. So that's all we must do with our talents and our gifts. So the Torah is your way of life. Yeah. But now you go and you take hands with an unbeliever in your work and how are you going to prosper mm. if Yahweh is going to because one of you is going to be pulling on the short end I mean <laughs> Yahweh going to yeah. judge him for his wrongness yeah. how are you supposed to be blessed if you've yeah. taken his hand yeah but that's where the danger comes in because then you're taking counsel from those people how to do your business yes and they are not, I mean they can be they're blessed. not cared about the Torah observance I mean, to Yahweh if you all if you, only thing you care about is making money and getting rich, then yes, okay, take hands with them because they get their reward in this life. Yeah. That's what Matthew tells us. Yeah. But if there's a bigger picture for you, then you cannot because you can't prosper in everything. Yeah. I mean, Yahweh prospered Potiphar's house because of your sake, yes. because he had a plan. Yeah. But we can't all go with, oh, well, that's what happened there, so I can... You know what I mean? If, you, if you're a slave and you're sold into that, you don't have a choice. You must do what you're... Yeah, but the difference is Yosef wasn't a partner with yes, Potiphar. No, he, he was a had, worker. He had a good work ethic. <laughs> yes, he had a good work ethic and that's, and that's what, what Yahweh... Blessed. Yes. Yeah. So it doesn't mean you can't work in this world. Yeah. We're talking about when there's authority over matters that you have say with. If you're allowing a, a wrong one to have, join in that authority with you, how do decisions get made? Because somewhere it's going to pull wrong that's why it's not a blessing but blessed are you when you don't that's why Shaul appeals don't get unequally yoked because it's not like okay but we're already there what do we do well it's going to be tough 
because it's it's hard. But when so he's he's cautioning the better way to press through and succeed, which is what the word prosperous in Hebrew means, is to do it with Yahweh without anything pulling you away from Yahweh. That's the picture we get. And Yosef could be prosperous and exceed and succeed in whatever position he was put in because Yahweh was with him. And Yahweh was with him because he obeyed Yahweh. And he, he overcame temptations. He overcame the lusts of the flesh. He didn't take position of advancement to his head. He still submitted. I mean, he said to the wife, he's given me everything except you. I'm not going to touch you. I mean, many people in the flesh would have said, well, thank you. I'll take this right too. Because in the flesh, that's what we do. But now in Messiah, we have a different mind. We have the mind of Messiah, which subjects itself, every thought, every action to Messiah, every dealing. If you cannot subject every single business deal that you engage with to Yahweh, it shouldn't be done. If you cannot ex you know, submit every action of your day to Yahweh, it should not be done. Because then it becomes an unequal yoking. And as Yehuda turning aside gives us a lesson of, this unequal yoking causes, causes a confusion. And it causes a breaking, a distrust. It causes a departure from prosperity, advancing and succeeding. You know, it causes a disruption of bearing the fruit of set apartness. So these are valuable lessons for us to understand through the life of Yosef that we are in a system where we have to, but you still, just because you're working, maybe you work at a company that doesn't uphold the Torah, it doesn't mean you can't uphold the Torah and be prosperous in your work ethic and have Yahweh with you. But we do see a clear difference in taking a joint partnership with that which doesn't gel. That's why when we wear a cord of blue that's thread, it highlights again what we've been bound to and what we are bound with. When we're not bound, when we are bound with things that shouldn't be there, which way is that thread going to be pulled? Because it will bring a tearing. And that's not a prosperous or blessed thing to have. Does that make sense? I think what we're going to do is we're going to carry on with Yosef's account in the house and then in the prison after lunch. Um, Renee's got a question, and Carol's kind of possibly answering it, but I'll leave it out for, for everyone. No, it's why did Tamar not just tell Yehuda it was her when she covered her face? Why allow him to think she's a cult prostitute? The ancient family is confusing. <laughs> a lot of the things are confusing for us, and I think it's a valuable lesson to, for people to ask. When Yehuda said, when, he, when, he, when, he, when his rod, the cord, and the seal was brought out, he said, she has been more righteous than I. This, I think, was the turning point in Yehuda's departure from the house, because now he realized about covenant and genealogy. And that's where he could say she's been more righteous because she hasn't acted. He went off and just, he's lost his wife. He just wants a good time. And she did it for pres preservation of seed. And also, I mean, we talked about it in the week. A, a daughter yeah. is under her father's protection yes. until she gets a husband. Yeah. Then she's under her husband's protection. That's why he said to her, okay, go back to your father's house. Yeah. In your widowhood until my son has grown up. Yes. He, if she, I mean, she'd have, if her dad died, she'd have nobody to look after. She'd have after. nothing, yeah. She didn't have children, sons to look after in her old age. She had that in mind, obviously. Yes. And if she had told him it was her, and she, he already decided he wasn't going to give his third son to her because they all die. I yes. mean, he said it. Yeah. He would never have no. given her seed. And where would she be? Yeah. I mean... I think we're given all these. No, I think I know we're giving all, given all these examples in Scripture that Shaul says they're written as examples for us, so that we don't fall into the same mistakes. So praise Yahweh that we've got all these things. We go, that's confusing because yes, it's good. If it wasn't there, what would happen when people mess up like this? What do we do? Well, now we make sure you don't mess up like this. 
you know, or you don't try to find ulterior, ulterior motive and ways to try and gain a blessing through wrong ways. You can't get Yahweh's blessing by being in the council of the wrongs, in the path of sinners or in the seat of scoffers. But you can be in that blessing when you are staying in Yahweh, you know, and with those that are wise and that aren't scoffing, that are praising, that aren't wrong, that are walking in set apartness. That's who we should be in unity with and walking together in step with, you know, because then the assurance that Yahweh is not just with me, but he's with us, it confirms that in each and every one of us. And there isn't a pulling taking place. And I feel that there are many congregations or fellowships today that there's a lot of pulling taking place because within it we've 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 experienced other fellowships commenting and it's difficult for me to comment on somebody else's house i mean we can see this is what we do but it's difficult for me to tell you if you want to stay in that house we can say that's not what we do and what we see is that we can be straight we don't agree with certain things but if in a house there's these things, there's a constant tearing and pulling, and that causes confusion and foul deeds, and it causes whisperings and, and things that shouldn't happen. So we want Yahweh with us so that we can prosper and succeed in our, in our individual walk and our collective walk. Therefore, we've got to make sure that we are guarding ourselves against wrong counsel, wrong paths, wrong seats. Amen. Amen. But we'll look a little bit more at Yosef's diligence in guarding the word of Yahweh and his presence in his life. Uh, he was possibly the only person who had Yahweh with him in the whole of Mitzrayim at that historical moment. And it would have been so easy for people today when you feel that isolated to just do what the world does. But Yosef maintains a standard of set apartness. So there's no excuse for us. To say it's too hard. To it's obey. So yeah, I know I've put in the notes there, there's a transaction that took place. The Midianite traders sold him to the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites came and sold to Potiphar. And we also see, again, it's a picture of two major groups that have denied Messiah. You've got, you've got at large... Rabbinic Judaism, if you want to say Yehuda, that has denied Messiah. And then you've got Christianity as well, that's a bit, you know, that's the scattered house of Israel that's denied Messiah, that's sold him. You know, because when Yehuda sold Messiah for 30 pieces of silver, it was a betrayal. So the selling is a picture of betrayal because you are. You have no right to give somebody over anyway to sell. So who's, who are you to sell and gain something out of somebody's death? Mm. We also see it as a clear picture. The one, the Ishmaelites, represent those who want covenant, but they don't. They want the Abrahamic promise. That's a right, Abrahamic promise. But they don't want this covenant genealogy that says we need this Torah. That's why. So you've got, in one sense, you've even got Islam that's represented by this, they wanting, they they all say they're children of Abraham, mm. you know, and then you've got closer to home the the Yaakov Esau mix that's represented as well. Is it's almost like our brothers that are they've started a bit with covenant, but now they've cast it aside and they've sold the master's identity by saying we 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 are actually mm. denying the need to obey this, you know. So there's, there's a couple of pictures that we see in being sold twice. It's, it's really a picture of all humanity has actually denied Messiah and have sold him into slavery, thinking that they now have a right and authority to take up authority for themselves. And that's where you can view it from various angles. It still applies. It's not just to one isolated group of people. I do think that anybody who doesn't call on the name of your Messiah has sold him I mean, for they, a price. They sold him at his crucifixion. Yes. And then now if you deny him, you sell him. Yes. So there was a physical transaction that took place before he was put on the stake and when he was arrested. And like Colleen saying, now there are many that are still selling him mm. by denying him, you know. 
okay, let's have lunch and then we'll carry on this. If the more discussions about this, it's great. We must think about it. There's so many things that start to pop in our minds about mm. Yosef's uh, example for us. Let's pray. Master Yahweh, we thank you for your word that continues to strengthen us and that you continue to show us wonders in your Torah. It's not just, oh, we've heard this, but that we get to hear it. We get to learn new things or have light shed once again on things that we, we read before. Now it brings it to light. We see the relevance of it. We see how alive it is. Such a wonder and a joy for us to sit in your presence on this, your Shabbat, that we delight ourselves in and recognizing what you've called us out from. Because if we weren't sitting here at your feet on your Shabbat, marked by your spirit, sealed by your spirit, where would we be? Uh, we'd be in wrong councils, sinners' paths. We'd be in scoffers' seats. But we here, here seated at your feet, seated at your table, being thankful for your living bread that you give us for life, your living waters that you give to refresh, to cleanse, to set us apart in your truth. And we, we desire to be completely set apart and guard our hearts in unity of your spirit, Master Yahweh, so that we can make sure, as we saw from the pictographic, that our feet are secure in you, our head, that we walk in step with your word and not out of step, not turning aside, but running in the way of your commands and lifting up a banner of praise to you and making your laws the songs of our sojournings. Master Yahweh, we thank you that even as we partake in a meal together, it's your provision, your Shabbat table is, that we come to delight ourselves in, in the joy and wonder of being able to be a people that praise you without hindrance. Thank you that you've cleansed us from all darkness and sin and lawlessness. You've redeemed us from a futile way of life so that we can serve you in uprightness and set apartness and truth. We bless you, and as we partake in this meal, we thank you, Master Yahweh, for your provision, for your protection, and for you making us able to press through and succeed and be prosperous in you. In the name of Yahushua, our Messiah. Amen and Amen.